June 4th Pinellas Board meeting, that is June 8th. Please stand for the invocation pledge, which will be given by Mayor Bajowski. For our um, comrades in uh, Uvalde and Buffalo, each to his own faith. Thank you. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we will start our introductions, and I'm going to start with Council Member Floyd. Uh, Council Member Richie Floyd, District 8, St. Petersburg. Glad to be here. Karen Seal, Pinellas County Commission. Bonnie Noble, Kansas City, representing the inland communities. Julie Ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council. Michael Smith, Vice Mayor, City of Largo. Dave Eggers, Pinellas <coughs> County Commission. Janet Long, Pinellas County Commission. Whit Blanton, Executive Director. My name is Cookie Kennedy. I'm the Chair of Ford Pinellas, and I'm also the Mayor of the City of Indian Rocks Beach. Tina, are there any citizens wishing to be heard on any item not already on the agenda today? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you. And we'll start with recognitions and announcements. Whit? We have one recognition. Let Mayor Kennedy get over here. Well, I just wanted to um, recognize you for three years of outstanding service here with Pinellas County and with Ford Pinellas. So um, the, you, know, you get a great little plaque and a great little pen. And I just wanted to say that you've, um, you've really met all of our expectations and you've done a fantastic job managing some very difficult projects including the Indian Rocks Beach Visioning Project <laughs> <laughs> um, and waterborne transportation and um, downtown mobility study. And we kind of throw you into to all the, the little rough patches we have around the county. And I just want to say you've done a fantastic job. So, thank you Sure. Thank you, Whit. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's been a great three years, and I really enjoy the time that I've been here, and I've learned so much along the way. So thank you all. And you're obligated to stick around for 10 or 20 more years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very good. So, you know, I recognize people, and I don't know where Jared's at. Why don't you come up here for a minute? Oh, he's not here? Okay. Okay, the next one is happy birthday to David Edgars. Would you come up? I know your birthday was a few days ago because I saw it on Facebook. So I always remember those that are Facebook. And I just, this isn't a birthday, but I was at the Largo City Commission last night, and um, I'm finishing my degree in public policy and public administration, and I had to go to a first reading and do a presentation. And while I was there, their vice mayor, Michael Smith, ran the meeting, and I have to tell you, he did an awesome job. But that's not why I'm really up here saying this, but Michael, I'd like you to come up for a second.
You know, um, sometimes who we are isn't easy for us. And Michael gave a very heartfelt uh, discussion about who he is as a person. And um, it had to do with pride this month. And I just wanted you to know that I thought it was very uplifting. And I want you to know how much I appreciate you. And this is for you. Thank you. <laughs> So next we have our consent agenda item. It's an action item. And do any of the board members wish to pull any items from the consent agenda today? Hearing none. Move Tina. approval. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Tina, what would you? I just want to make sure that we ask for public comment. There's is no there any public comment on there's, this item? There's not, but okay. for the record, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> we will move now to our public hearing. Uh, these are all roll calls, and this is uh, for the Metropolitan Planning Organization. And are there any questions at this time? Who will be presenting? Alexis. Okay, Alexis. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Alexis Boback. I'm a planner with Ford Pinellas. Um, today I'll be presenting on the annual update of the fiscal year 22-23 to 26-27 Transportation Improvement Program, also known as the TIP. So as you all know, um, the TIP is a federally required document from us as an MPO, and every year we have to update it and check off some certain boxes so that we can get uh, transportation funding for the county. Um, so at this time last year, um, with the annual update of the TIP, we also approved the 2021 MPO priority list. And um, that was then, tr then transmitted to FDOT, where uh, they used that to formulate the draft tentative work program. Um, and last year, um, in November, that draft tentative work program was approved by this board. And they were uh, public comments received on that draft work program. Um, FDOT took those into consideration. And then in January of this year, that work program was finalized and sent to the state for approval. And we are here now at the next annual update of the TIP, which includes that um, work program from last year, the 2021 work program. And we, uh, today we will also be looking at the 2022 pro uh, pro sorry, priority list that will be approved for next year's TIP. So what is included in the TIP? So of course we have our priority lists. Um, there are four. Um, the multimodal priority lists, the transportation alternatives priority lists, and then the two SCTPA priority lists. And again, these will be coming to you today for approval as well. And then of course the most important thing, we have the 2022-23 to 2026-27 FDOT five-year work program, and that includes any state or federally funded transportation projects in Pinellas County. We also include the public transportation, airports, and ports work programs. And we include the Pinellas County Capital Improvement Program and the local government's work programs. Um, these are not required by the federal government, but we include them to, um, as a benefit for our locals, for them to see all of the funding in one place. Um, and these are updated in the fall after they're adopted locally. So you will see those uh, later this year. So just a quick run through of what's in the newest FDOT work program. Included in your agenda packet, you should have had these supplementary materials, um, the tip summary tables that include all of the projects, um, the location, the description, and their stat funding status. So anything that is grayed out has had some kind of change from last year. 
And there was also a link to the FDOT um, GIS application where you can view all of these projects on a map. Um, and on the left, there are some filters where you can sort different types of projects. You can look at the funding amounts, things like that. And just a quick summary of the changes from last year's work program. There have been 17 new projects added to the work program, almost all of which have some kind of multimodal components within them. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are often seen as um, urban corridor improvements, and those include some com complete streets-like design additions. They'll often add these on to some resurfacing projects or widening projects just to make them more ped bike and uh, uh, transit friendly. There have been 12 projects that have been completed and removed and 30 projects that have changed status, whether uh, they have progressed in funding or they have been held back or delayed in funding. And the, again, those are grayed out in those tables. Just a quick overview of the ped bike project. So these are all of the separated paths and trails that are currently funded. I won't go through all of them, but you can see on the right where they are in the county. And these are uh, the rest of the separated paths and trails. These are all of these sidewalk projects that are currently funded in the county. And these are the three pedestrian overpasses that are currently funded. These are some of the multimodal improvements of interest. These are not all of the complete streets type projects that are in the work program, but these are the ones that were on the priority list from last year that are being um, funded currently. So the next steps, um, today's action item, we recommend to the board to approve the annual update of the TIP, and if approved, this document will be adopted as the official TIP and transmitted to the federal government for approval. Are there any questions? Are there any questions at this time? Tina, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this, the, the transportation improvement program? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Yes. I feel like I need to point out one of the items that you have listed on your uh, on the map of the uh, overpasses, the trail sure. overpasses. Sure. That uh, one of those shows uh, the State Road 60 at uh, Old Coachman overpass for the Duke Energy Trail, and I wanted to let the board know that uh, I've heard from the Florida Department of Transportation that they've begun looking at a concepts, several concepts for that overpass, and they've run into some uh, obstacles with Duke Energy. Uh, which uh, has rejected all of the concepts that the department has submitted. So uh, they've looked at an underpass, but there's a lot of utilities in that area, so that would be cost prohibitive. So they are now uh, switching gears to look at an at-grade intersection improvement to improve the safety at that location. And we don't know what that's gonna look like yet, but I wanted to make the board aware that um, what we had hoped would happen may not be able to happen, and I don't wanna say definitely won't, but that's the indication we've gotten from the department on that. So just to, in, in the interest of being clear about what we're showing in the TIP, it's still a funded overpass, but it may not end up being an overpass. Thank you, Witt. Any questions for Witt? Hearing none, is there a motion? Motion to approve. And is there a second? Second. Okay. Tina, will you, this is a roll call. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Council Member Driscoll? Aye. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Council Member Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Council Member Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. And Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion that carries. And we will thank you. Uh, we will go on to 6B, annual adoption of transportation priority list, and that would be presented by Chelsea. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so this is going to be a three-parter. Uh, so the, for the first part, I do have a PowerPoint. I just want to walk you through because the priority list that's included in your packet today is a bit different than the one that you saw last month, and I want to walk through those changes with you. 
Um, so every year we take a look at our transportation priority list and we update that list to remove anything completed, adjust relative priorities based on work that's happened over the past year, and also advance projects that are identified in the tip that Alexis just presented to you. So the priority list that we are working with today, these are projects that we're going to submit to FDOT after this meeting and next year when we bring you the tip back, that tip will be based on the priorities that you're going to see today. Um, so just a little bit of a reminder on how we score our priority projects. There's a lot of different criteria that goes into our scoring, but really when you break down the points, about 25% of the points that we assign to new priorities go to safety, about 22% to equity and health, health, about 18% to mobility, and you'll see the breakdown as we go around. So when we get new project applications from our local government partners, this is the lens through which we look to evaluate them when we add them to the priority list. So we do have a number of projects that have been removed from the priority list. Uh, this mirrors what was in your packet from last month. Uh, but the downtown St. Petersburg area network analysis, that project is now moving towards implementation phase. Uh, Christina Mendoza is going to present on that later on your agenda. So because our planning work for that phase is done, we're removing it from the list. The downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach busway, uh, we've been working with the city of Clearwater and PSCA on this project for a few years. Uh, however, the, the recommended solutions that were identified to connect downtown Clearwater to the beaches through that project were not deemed appropriate uh, by the city uh, and by PSTA. So that project, the grant has been expended uh, and we are removing it from the priority list at this time. And then also PSTA transit along the State Road 60 corridor. That was a project that we prioritized a few years ago. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation was able to secure some capital funding for that, uh, for that alignment connecting the beaches to TIA through the State Road 60 corridor. Um, however, at this time, now that the funding is available, PSTA doesn't actually have the operational funding uh, to be able to utilize that capital funding. So we're going to be shifting that money to a different transit project. Uh, that way PSTA can still utilize the funding that's been allocated to the agency uh, for a priority that they could use this coming year. So there are a number of projects that did receive funding in the work program. There's three different segments of Pasadena Avenue. These are operational and safety improvements. The construction is already underway. These are improvements that were identified through the FDOT quarter study uh, in that area just about two years ago. And also in St. Pete, uh, the Complete Streets project on 22nd Street South. Uh, actually, 22nd Street South has a number of uh, segments that are identified in the work program, and this is just one of them. This was the Complete Streets priority that this board added to the list last year, or I'm sorry, that this board just this past year uh, recommended for funding. And then we have a number of new priorities. Uh, the 62nd Avenue Complete Streets Project, uh, that's uh, the annual Complete Streets Priority Project from 49th Street over to 34th Street uh, in the unincorporated uh, Lelman area. And the next four, um, these are Alt-19 operational improvements. These are projects that were not on the priority list when you saw them last month. We've been working with the Florida Department of Transportation to go through the Alt-19 corridor study recommendations that were made over the last couple of years, working really closely with our local government partners to identify which of, those recommend, which of the recommendations from that study could be implemented and what do they look like? And also, how do we kind of break up the pri those projects so that they're in smaller bites so that we can get them done more quickly? And this is what we ended up with. The first one um, is from Wilson to Curlew. This is up in the Dunedin area. Uh, this is a project to add some, uh, some landscape medians and some pedestrian crossings along the way. This is an interim uh, improvement. It will not block anyone's access to any of their driveways. Um, it's really just adding those pedestrian crossings where feasible. Um, we've been working with the city of Dunedin and with FDOT to identify those improvements, and we're hoping to move forward with that. So that's why you'll see it pretty high up on the priority list. And the next three are intersection improvements that were identified through the Alt-19 quarter study as well at Rosary, East Bay, and Walsingham. And the, the Alt-19 quarter study had a lot of improvements identified. So we really went in and looked at the data to identify the intersections that had the greatest safety challenges. And that's why you'll see them in this order. Uh, Olmerton Road was another intersection that we looked at, and while Olmerton had more total crashes, the crashes weren't actually as severe or at a, as high of a rate as these other intersections had. So that's why you'll see them in that order. 
And then the last one is the 34th Street Transit Capital. This is where we're shifting that money from the State Road 60 Express Bus Service to the 34th Street Corridor. 34th Street, the City of St. Petersburg had a complete streets grant uh, to help kind of spruce up that corridor as the bat lanes are going in uh, and stations are being added uh, for enhanced transit service. So this funding will really provide the additional capital to really make some stop and station enhancements uh, for the upcoming uh, service enhancements coming to the area. And then these, there's some other new project priorities. Uh, the top two are from the active transportation plan. Uh, the first one is looking at multimodal improvements along the Sunset Point corridor. Uh, not necessarily right on Sunset Point, but somewhere in that vicinity, connecting Alt-19 over to the Philippi Parkway. The first step in the study is going to be doing an alignment, st uh, alignment study to really figure out where that's going to go, and then we'll advance it towards construction. The second is a, an overpass for the Pinellas Trail Loop in the 4th Street Gandhi uh, area. Uh, and then the first step of that, of course, will be an alignment study to identify where exactly that overpass could go. If you're familiar with this area, it's, there's a lot going on. Um, so we'll figure out where it's going to go and then, again, advance that for construction funding through the work program. And then the last two were project applications that we received from our local government partners from our call for projects. The first is in Pinellas Park on 78th Avenue, and the second on Bel Air Road uh, in the unincorporated Clearwater area of Pinellas County. Uh, other changes since uh, the last presentation, Witt just covered this. Uh, the Pinellas Trail overpasses at State Road 60 and State Road 580. The project descriptions have been changed. Before it said overpass, now it says crossing uh, because we are not certain we can do an overpass in these locations. So we changed the project descriptions so that we're not limiting ourselves. And if we can't get an overpass, we can still get some kind of enhanced safety, safe crossing in those areas. So for our next steps, we are seeking a uh, uh, approval of the priority list uh, today, and then we'll forward it to FDOT for consideration as they develop the next work program. And I'm happy to take any questions. Karen? So what you mentioned, the Duke e Energy issues at State Road 60, but what's the issues at State Road 580? Is that also Duke? <clears throat> yes, my understanding is that um, an overpass would encroach into the 25 foot buffer that they have from their overhead wiring and it would just get too close to that um, And so we have had over the years um, At least some complaints. I don't know how many from people who've had pacemakers uh, Where they feel like a little bit of a zing. I think a couple of our bicycle pedestrian advisory committee members have reported that um, And so Duke I think is, is being sensitive to that We will continue to explore any feasible options we can have there. Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just probably don't remember what occurred, but I see where we have removed um, rapid transit from downtown Clearwater to the airport. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Sure. Um, and this has been something that the Amplify Clearwater Chamber has long advocated for um, the... The first issue was that uh, we were looking at, an ex at a transit lane over the Memorial Causeway Bridge. And uh, while there's room to do it, uh, the city of Clearwater um, objected to the location or alignment of that uh, dedicated lane uh, because the initial DOT um, analysis of that, the design, was to run that um, not primarily, but at least a portion through the median where they have their landscaping. Um, and then on the north side, there's mangrove conflicts, and there's no more mitigation credits, apparently. Uh, and then when you get to the south side, you've got to figure out how to get back over and cross um, the second bridge. So there was just a lot of uh, conflicts there, and, and we received uh, correspondence from the city of Clearwater, oh, about four or five months ago, six months ago, saying that uh, they prefer that we just not pursue that project any further, even though there was a little bit of design money left to maybe work out a solution, they were um, ready to abandon that project. Um, in terms of the um, express service to, air, to the airport, that's simply a funding issue for PSTA. Uh, the capital is there, but they do not have the operating resources to run that service. Currently. So to our number one tourist destination, we can't figure out how we're gonna make a priority to pay for rapid transit from downtown Clearwater to the airport. That's correct. And what's wrong with that picture? 
No offense, <laughs> but I mean, what is wrong with that picture? That's, to me, unacceptable. We've been talking about this for 20 years, 15 years. I, I'm not approving removing that from the list. I don't care what PSTA says. I mean, that, it's, it's, a, it's a priority for us, isn't it? Whether it's a priority for them and how it gets paid for. I mean, we have got to have priority transit, express transit from the airport to these major destinations, or we got to stop advertising for them. I mean, it's just, <clears throat> it's ridiculous. I don't disagree with you. I think yeah. uh, we've, we've all acknowledged that PSTA uh, has a lack of resources to undertake new service. And I, and I get that. <clears throat> and I get that people in much higher positions than me have to figure out how to get that funding. So uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to remove that from the list. I don't want to put something on the priority list that will not happen, that will not be a project in the sh And in I'm the saying time it has to. So that money goes away if it can't be used. Commissioner Edgars. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess it seems strange that we even wor went down this path to try to get capital for this project, the one that we're talking about right now without having some level of commitment for the operating. Just, I, feel, I feel like we've, almost like bait and switch, you know, it's, it's just strange that um, this is a major corridor um, and um, when we start going down that path and um, you, we hope that our partners are beside us. Um, so that, that I, have a, I have a real problem with that. Um, the, uh, the trail over, the, uh, over 580, um, when we were looking at this location, trying to connect the North County Loop, there was nothing mentioned that there was issues with health, except that it's a trail, so it's good for your health, right? Um, so that now, I don't know where that came from, that we that it creates a problem so that anywhere on the trail it creates a problem, or if it goes up 20 feet closer to the wires, it creates a problem? Or where's the science behind this? Um, and I think, we need to, I think we need to hold Duke accountable a little bit to where did this come from? Um, and maybe they did, and it, you know, I missed it. But somewhere, there was a lot of other paths to take that we turned down because it was so convenient to do the, the trail. So, um, Well, I, I will say that I think our, policy, our priority has long been to complete the loop. And then, Commissioner, I think it was maybe two years ago when um, you, you made uh, an issue of getting the overpasses and getting the safety right before we proceed with more segments. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this project has been you know, in the pipeline for many, many years. The county applied for Sun Trail funding, and that funding came from the state for that segment. They did not apply for the overpass. So the overpass was something we were going to add later. Uh, this is a very new issue that was just brought to my attention within the last two weeks um, by the Department of Transportation and reaching out and trying to work with Duke Energy. I think it's a relatively new issue for Duke Energy. Um, it is only where they see the trail overpasses encroaching into either close to or within a 25-foot buffer of those high-tension wires that are over the trail. Um, we have had, uh, over the years I've been here, it's been reported by one or two people, it hasn't been a lot, that there have been people with pacemakers who felt some sort of an impact uh, when they go over the trail that's over US-19, I believe. Is that, that's the right one, I think. At Enterprise and also up by the Pasco County line. Okay, up by the Pasco line as well. So I think that concern has, has gotten to Duke Energy, and you may recall that I think it was 2018, we had a workshop on the trail loop uh, at the Public Works Complex, and Duke Energy had a representative there, and they were adamant that it met, that there were no concerns with anybody's pacemakers or any other issues. So it's a bit of a change in direction uh, from what I remember from that workshop four or five years ago. Yeah, well, far be it from me. I'm not a doctor, and I didn't do other research. And I hope that they're doing <clears throat> that research and accumulating information. I mean, because when you drive a bicycle up that, up, sometimes it causes me a flutter too. And I and I just want to make sure I understand the science of it, not 
one or two people that might be calling in, and maybe it's been a hundred, and they've got they've got that kind of they kept got that kind of data, but they did not bring that up before. Um, you know, FDOT problem. is here. Is do you want to add anything to this conversation? Come up. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, good afternoon all. Jensen Hackett with the Department of Transportation. Um, one thing that I want to uh, just point out with this, um, as Whit was saying, it is a new issue. Um, this is something, um, as we were in our talks with Duke about the State Road 60 and Old Coachman overpass, that this came up. Um, from what we've heard from Duke is that all of the concerns and what Chelsea was just saying about the Enterprise overpass going all the way up to State Road 54 in Pasco County, it's actually the same uh, transmission line from Duke. What they've been telling us is that they, um, in the future, will up the capacity of this line, and that's the problem with where we're talking about the pacemaker issues and the potential for the shocking issues and that type of thing. So that's what they've discussed with us, um, and that's as far as we've gotten with them on those discussions. Well, um, then it seems, it seems like a change from their pers perspective. I mean, we make decisions based on the information they give us, and I think we need to be pushing back at least, and I'm not saying that what they're doing isn't right. It's just that I didn't know about expansion of service. We didn't know about that. I mean, there were a lot of people who wanted us to, to push it over to McMullen Booth. And we said, well, it's probably not you know, safe there as on the trail. Well, now I'm hearing it may not be safe on the trail. Um, and that's, that's bothersome. That's a problematic and it's a lot of money that we've spent going that way. So anyway, I'm just thinking that, you know, again, this is, a, this is a big deal to me, and I think it's irresponsible on Duke's part um, to not have this information for us ahead of time. This isn't, this isn't new technology. This isn't new anything. Um, and the other thing I was going to bring up, the third thing I wanted to ask about is this, you know, Clearwater to Clearwater Beach. Um, my understanding, we had looked at this crossing over the road and, and going on the south side. Um, so it was kind of out of the median. Um, <clears throat> and that's, I mean, that was, I don't think we were doing it just in isolation. I'm not saying that we got the blessing from, from the city of Clearwater, but that was discussed as well. Mm -hmm. And they were concerned about the crossover. So the issue is, we shouldn't ask for earmarks. Uh, the problem is uh, this is a legislative earmark that was for design. Uh, and when you get an earmark for design, you can't do planning and alternatives analysis. You do design. And so the DOT didn't really have money budgeted for design or, or for anything other than design. So there was um, about 15% of the effort looking at some alternatives. But um, they were charged with putting a design together and Clearwater um, could not get comfortable with those designs and there wasn't really funding to look at alternatives. We proposed putting in funding for a PD&E study which would look at alternatives and concepts and uh, that's when we heard back from the city of Clearwater saying, you know what, we're just not that interested in trying to work something out on the Memorial Causeway Bridge. So, um, it doesn't mean there won't be transit service improvements in that corridor. It just means a dedicated lane for buses is not something they want to see happen if it, if it impacts the landscaping. And we didn't really have money funded to do a full bore evaluation of alternatives. And they haven't requested further um, project priorities to look at anything else. So at this point, we think it's best just to take it off the priority list. Now there is an urban gondola study underway that T-Bartit is leading in the corridor and that's developing some concepts and you know maybe that's a solution. We've also talked about the water taxi service and getting that up and running again. So you know we're not ignoring the need to get people over there, it's just the dedicated busway right now didn't seem to have a path forward. Okay. And no pushback on the other, other things that we're looking at. Well, at this point, no, but um, <clears throat> we do have Brian Pissarro here from t Barda, so Brian could maybe address the gondola issue at some point. Is there an opportunity <clears throat> to have someone, a representative from Duke, come to our meeting and talk yeah, about this? Yeah, I think we can do that. Maybe yeah. that would be helpful. Um, Commissioner Long, did you want to say something? 
Well, I did, but at this point, I'm almost feeling like it's a futile effort because I hear Whit saying he doesn't want to leave it on there. I hear Julie and David and myself saying we do because if we don't, if we don't put things down that we know we really need, then what are we doing here? I mean, is this just an exercise in futility that we are sharing, that these are our needs, and we have all these other folks that say, well, we're not going to do it, we're not going to fund it, we're not going to, and I mean, you know, I'm just getting so over it. Don't even get me going yet, because we haven't got to the T. Barter report, but you'll really see me ring my bell, because we, we are, we are as uh, Mary Bojowski said, a tourist destination in the world, by the way, not just in our own country. Um, and it's falling on deaf ears. It falls on deaf ears, especially in Tallahassee, because they are the ones who can help us, and they don't. And the appropriations that we had for them to be able to help on these kind of issues, they veto. Well, they didn't. The legislature passed it, and the governor vetoed it. So I don't want to see it come off the list. I think that just. What, at what point do we put it back on the list? Ten years from now? Five years from now? Wait, let me, let me, Commissioner Seal wanted to say something, sure. and then I'll have you. Oh, that's okay. I just want to echo the comments from my colleagues, and I feel like this has long been a problem. I mean, <laughs> and we need to come up with a solution. Actually, some of you all know one of the solutions that I proposed, and I've met recently with the city of Clearwater new manager is you could and I had talked with DOT in the past what you could do is that going across the causeway you could use golf carts or green cars and you could go over on the side of the sidewalk and then hit the trail that's quite wide on the south side and a golf cart would fit across the small bridge as well I mean you could have a little you know especially during heavy season something going back and forth rather than the jolly trolley and have it be effective and efficient. And, um, you know, DOT at one point was even maybe willing to put a light, if necessary, on the west side of the Memorial Causeway Bridge to stop so that golf carts could get over if they needed to wherever it was traveling. So I, I think it's really an important option. I agree with... Mayor um, Kennedy, we need to get Do. I mean, get Duke here because for years and years we've talked about this electromagnetic, assured our citizens it's safe, and now you're going. It, it's a big question mark, mm -hmm. and that's that's very concerning. As someone who negotiated with Duke to get the rest of this trail done and to come up with, we had an expired agreement with Duke and we brought everybody into a room and made it work. I, we need to be looking at this from all kinds of viewpoints. So I concur and I don't know how you make a priority list that keeps us on here, but we need to do both of those, all three of those things. I think uh, Mayor Bajowski. I just want to say, you know, I'm, I, I know the, I mean, especially the downtown to the airport. If we don't start making connections to our tourist destinations um, from where they get, how they get here, you know, PIE as well, I mean, we're worthless. We really are as a, as a tourist destination. We really are. And I don't think the PSTA gets to dictate what our priorities are. No offense against them. You know, and it's not, it's not meant that way. But I don't think if we say this is a priority, which we have been for years, I sat on that board for nine years, and that was five, six, seven years ago. So I, I, I don't, I definitely don't want to see these removed. Oh, I just thought of one more thing. I, I just want to point out, I don't know how many of you are aware, and it almost slipped my mind, but you know, all of Airco, the old Airco golf property, is about to be redeveloped, and it is, enormous what the plans are for that. So if we think we have
problems now, Mayor, moving in and around that area with the airport. Just wait another five years and see what it's going to be like. Wait. I'd like to um, just address this issue in the, in the in the timing that we situation we have. So PSTA does not have the operating funds to match the capital that's in this project. So I don't want to lose that money. The project we're proposing to switch it to is also a high priority transit project, and it is our first complete streets project that we funded. And that project's going under construction this year. PSTA told us that they really didn't have any plans for enhancing the transit stations along 34th Street in the Skyway Marina District. And so uh, it just made sense to me that we, they've already made a commitment to uh, implementing high frequency, limited stop uh, express bus service in that quarter to go with the DOT resurfacing project, which is about to begin, Jensen. And DOT has, I think, done a really good job. They're putting 10 foot wide sidewalks on both sides of the road. They have agreed to a modification of 34th Street to, to have a, a bus and turn only lane with red pigment pavement, which got really expensive. And so they had PSTA commit to this additional service in that corridor. So we're matching that with the capital that's available right now to make sure that we're doing transit signal priority and we're doing enhanced stations in that corridor. And it's one of the best, highest productive ridership corridors in Pinellas County. So I think it's going to a good project. We can still work with PSTA to figure out a way to implement service between downtown Clearwater and, and Tampa International Airport. But you know, this really comes back to being a regional solution because the service we had on the Courtney Campbell Causeway from the airport was operated by Hart. And in 2016, Hart killed that route. Um, and so it's, it serves Hillsborough and it serves us, and we do not have a mechanism for getting the funding in place because we've got competing priorities in the transit system and with limited resources. So I'm comfortable moving it to another priority that this board has established. We will continue to work to see how we can get this funded, and I completely agree with you. It's a no-brainer. But when PSTA tells me they can't operate it, that money goes back to Tallahassee and gets spread around the state. Except I have to ask you, the 34th thing, Street thing, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure this has been on there longer. And, and so how does that get the prior? I get it. I get it that it's a high functioning thing. And I remember us talking about it. And it's not, I certainly support it. But how do they get to say, oh, well, well, there's a resurfacing project on 34th Street. I'm just saying. And we're going I, I, with I don't resource. know how they get to do that. I mean, you know. Well, it's, it's really our choice, uh, ultimately, of where to put that capital money. That's what DOT told us. PSTA's preference was to have that money go into uh, vehicle replacement system-wide. And I wasn't comfortable with that. I wanted it to go to a specific priority project that this board established. And, and it goes with the resurfacing project. So I think it's a good project. And, and I have no ambiguity from the city of St. Petersburg of what they're doing in that corridor. I have a lot of ambiguity in the 60 corridor, frankly. So I go where there's certainty. And we have a good project in the 34th Street corridor. We don't have a project in the 60 corridor. We don't have consensus from the city of Clearwater of what to do in that corridor. And until we get that, well, we're not ready. that's the beach area. You're talking about over the it's bridge. It's really both, because oh. Clearwater's not stepping up to fund that service, and we don't have the funding. So this comes back to the age-old issue of transit, where we, our wants are a lot bigger than our ability to pay for it. David, did you want to say something? Uh, just um, what, what other alternatives are there besides the project that you just mentioned? Um, there are probably some other alternatives. I mean, we could have put that money into uh, vehicle replacement randomly. We could have put that into the Alt-19 corridor where we have a planning study underway, but I don't think we're quite ready yet to introduce a service plan. So we decided to go with something that was a little... Nothing, nothing on Drew Street? Um, there's already transit service on Drew Street. I'm not sure what additional capital we would need on Drew Street. Uh, and we've got a project on Drew Street that's so coming. So it's just with transit, cars. not transportation. This is transit capital funding. It's $3 million. Cookie County. 
Uh, yes. Question, I'll pivot a little bit. Um, the East Bay, West Bay, and Rosary, what kind of safety improvements are we, what are we talking about? So there's a variety of things that have been identified at each of those intersections. Some of them are upgrading the marking, the signing, uh, new backplates on the stoplights, um, certain things like that. Even uh, uh, even outside of the intersection, going about 300 feet out, there have been some identified improvements all along there, but nothing that'll add any physical capacity. Okay, and it, it says it all kind of in 2022. Um, 2022. Um, are we looking at them all at one time, or are we going to spread them out a little bit? Uh, we'll start with the first one and then first go one. on. Uh, but the, the Department of Transportation said that they may have capacity to do more than one, so they asked that we add a couple to the list, so we looked at the top three. Awesome. And Thanks. we will also note that we've been told by the Department of Transportation that sometimes at the end of a year there's some little small amounts of money left over for small projects, and our priority list has a lot of very, very expensive projects. So the reason that we advanced all three of them was thinking if there is some small pot of money left over to do a smaller scale project, these would be a fantastic candidate for those. Uh, we're told now all that money goes to Hillsborough because Hillsborough prioritizes smaller projects than we do. So, you're welcome. Anyone else on the board who wants to say anything? This whole side except Karen has been very silent. <laughs> saying that. Karen. Sorry, one more question, kind of a different study or a different twist of this. So how can there be a Duke Energy overpass at 4th Street in Gandy? you got high transmission lines there too, right? It's not one of the main power corridors. Oh, it is? Oh. Yeah, and I will also note that the problem with Duke isn't the trail itself. They still believe the trail is totally safe. It's just the overpasses that bring them even bring users even closer to the to the power lines. And fourth and Gandhi, those are lower uh, voltage transmission lines. And then tell me more what you're talking about on Sunset Point and Bel Air. <clears throat> so Sunset Point and Bel Air would probably be some kind of combination of a multi-use trail or a bike boulevard, maybe on one of the parallel roadways. But we did recognize that while there's the Ream Wilson and uh, the Druid Trail, there's a pretty significant gap heading you know, east-west in the northern part of the county. Uh, so that's our next priority, to figure out a way to have a safe way for bicyclists and pedestrians to get across the county. I do you have the right of way or the capacity to be able to do that? You're, I mean, I, there, I mean, Sunset Point's four lane road, but mm -hmm. Bel Air's two. Correct. And we wouldn't be looking to probably buy any more right of way. We'd be looking to utilize what's available. And if that means going maybe a block or two north into the neighborhoods and establishing a bicycle boulevard with some special lane markings and treatments, then that could be the way to go. So our first step would be we've identified the broad corridor. Now we kind of need to zoom in and figure out where exactly it would go. And we'll be doing that in partnership with Clearwater Safety Harbor in the county. Chelsea, I think that's maybe more true for Sunset Point where we don't really have a, a there are bike lanes on most of Sunset Point. A lot of people aren't comfortable with bike lanes on a 40 mile an hour road. Uh, so there's more room to, I think, work through the neighborhood area there. Mm -hmm. For Bel Air, we've already got a, par a, a part of a trail that exists on Bel Air Road, so it's completing that. Uh, and I think the county has a concept for doing that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, on Bel Air, the county does have a concept. It would be looking at some kind of uh, trail connection on the south side of the road, avoiding all of the tree impacts. Anyone else at this time before I ask Tina if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak on this item? Tina? Madam Chair, there is not. With, if, how can we, um, if we have somebody from Duke with uh, the FDOT here in eight, August because we don't have a meeting in uh, July, how does that affect us moving forward? Well, Chelsea, correct me if I'm wrong. I think for the overpass question, um, you, you propose some modified language, but we can mm. keep the priority as the priority uh, and, and keep it on the list. Yeah, we still believe that some kind of enhanced crossing safety improvement is needed at each one of those crossings, even if it ultimately is not an overpass. And we can continue to advocate for the overpass. Yes. Um, and, and we can see if we can prevail upon Duke to, to see the light. Um, and, and if they can't, then we'll look at an alternative solution for that. Um, the, the department has promised us that they would look at a safe at-grade crossing uh, for both those locations. And, you know, I think the signal that they approved uh, of 580 was appro approved as a temporary signal. 
So the assumption was long term from the department that there would be some sort of grade separated crossing there. Um, but you know, you've got to work with all the partners, and um, they're every much of a partner as PSTA is in this in this dance. So um, I think we should uh, ask Duke to come and speak to us about this issue. Um, and in the meantime, we'll just leave it on the priority list. And, and if you'd like, we can keep the language uh, overpass or suitable safe crossing, something like that. Is everybody, are we all in agreement with that so that we can have a motion? I, I think the, the bigger issue for me, I mean, I think that's easily solved until we get that feedback okay. and, and answer. Uh, the bigger issue for me is the $3 million that I don't want to lose for a project that's right. funded in FY23 and we don't have operating to go with it. So, um, I mean, we could, we could look at transit signal priority in the State Road 60 corridor. We could look at uh, enhanced bus shelters in the State Road 60 corridor. If you wanted to leave the capital in the corridor, we could. I just think it'll have more effectiveness right now in the 34th Street, and we can come back and work with PSDA on a solution in the city. Okay, I'm just David? one more. on the, yes. uh, and I'm not going to talk to that one, but uh, on the other issue, if we get Duke here, yes, uh, I think we just need to make sure we have the right person that I can that speak was thinking that too. Not only to policy, but can talk to this medical right. thing that we're talking about that we we questioned you know, vigorously right. when we were talking about which path to take and that we were assured there is no way. And we had people from the, from our residents that said, oh, you, you, yeah, I bet there is a problem. And we said, well, we're being told by the experts that there is not, and there is now. And there, and I don't, you know, it's a change. Well, whatever. Yeah. Uh, they, they knew the problems that we would be facing. So it's just somebody that can speak to both of that. It doesn't necessarily mean the decision maker, but somebody that can speak uh, with some authority. So. Will you yeah. take care of that? Yeah. Okay. So we're looking for a motion on the uh, multimodal priority list. Is second. second. Okay. Uh, this is a roll call. I'm sorry, Mayor Kennedy, I didn't get the second. Brandy, Thank Council you. Member Brandy Gabbard. Mayor Bujalski. Nay. Council Member Driscoll. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Commissioner Eggers? No. Commissioner Long? No. Council Member Floyd? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? No. Council Member Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, we're going to go, are you going to, okay, so we'll go Let's on to 6B2. <laughs> yes, 6B, okay. uh, it's a little Chelsea. bit more straightforward. Uh, the Transportation Good Alternatives Program <laughs> is reserved for projects that are uh, specifically related to bicycle and pedestrian projects. So each year we do a call for applications from all of our local government partners. They submit projects that they would like uh, to be considered. We have a competitive a scoring system that we use to rank them, and then we usually advance the top, you know, three or four projects to the list. Um, this year, because there is a new federal infrastructure bill uh, and additional funding coming out of the federal government, we decided to add all of the applications we received to the list in priority order. Uh, so on the list, you'll see that there are a total of five unfunded projects. Number one is a leftover from last year that wasn't able to be funded, uh, but the following four are all new applications. So we'd like to uh, recommend that the board approve the transportation alternatives priority list, uh, reflecting all the applications that were received in the past year. Is there anyone on the board who has a question for either Chelsea or possibly Witt? Council member, come on. So I just want to make sure we're adding more projects. We didn't take anything away. Correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. I would move approval. Anyone else have a question? Anyone else? Okay, we ha um, Tina, is there anyone in the, a member of the audience who'd like to speak on this issue? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you. We no have second. a first. Do we need a second from no second. No. Council Member Floyd? And that's a roll call. Mayor Bajowski? Aye. Council Member Driscoll? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Council Member Floyd? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? 
Yes, but I, at some point I want to talk about how it's the agenda that we got this month has been very difficult to open and to see things. So um, I'm having tech, quite a few technical difficulties. Council Member Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion, Motion carries, passes. and we will move on to the regional transportation priorities. Chelsea? Okay. So last one for me. So the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance covers the seven county region and all of the MPOs that are contained within it. Uh, the SCTPA meets uh, twice a year to develop uh, regional transportation priorities to co collectively advocate for on behalf of the entire region. A subset of the SCTPA is the TMA Leadership Group. That's the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group. That covers just the urban core of Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough counties. Uh, so the first one, uh, first list in your packet is the priority list for just the urbanized area. Uh, and you'll see this one also includes funded priorities as well as the unfunded priorities. Then the urbanized area sends their list up to the SCTPA to represent the broader region to add in the priorities from uh, Polk County, Sarasota, Manatee, and Hernando Citrus. So the SCTPA, you'll see, is really just, it includes the TMA list and adds on a few more. So the projects that are uh, in Pinellas County and in the urban core are exactly the same on both lists. So just to draw your attention to a couple of priorities that impact Pinellas County directly, we have the I-275 express lanes from downtown St. Petersburg uh, over into Hillsborough County, and then the regional rapid transit in the 275 corridor. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions from you today. Let's just take a second so everybody can review it. Chelsea, can you pull any of it back up? I don't have it on the computer. She's bringing him a hard copy okay. right now, though. <laughs> Commissioner Seal needs a copy, too. There's one. That was the only one I had. It was Tina's. Chelsea, my only copy. Yeah, they have it done. Is there anyone else having di difficulties so that everybody can? Are you? Okay. Let's just give five minutes so everybody can look at the, the uh, regional. I will note that the priority list is exactly the same as the draft that you saw last month. There are no other changes. Uh, the TMA and the SCT SCTPA have already approved it, but as a matter of procedure, we bring it back to each of the MPOs to ratify. Hey, Whit, when are we going to get um, Granicus up and running with our agendas? <laughs> because it will solve all of this. I had a terrible time getting access to the agenda today, too. I, I have it, but. Well, that's something we hope to do with our new budget. I thought it was in this last year's budget, the year that we're sitting in. Uh, we, we, it's been kind of put on hold by Granicus themselves for a little while. <laughs> No, not saying that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it needs to become a total priority because I have problems every time I come in here downloading my agenda. I was not aware of that. Got it, okay. I think everyone else is okay. Does anyone else have a question for Chelsea while some of us are reading it?
Please. <laughs> Amy, are we about set over there? We're set. Okay. All right, I think, I think everybody's got it. Any questions for Chelsea? So and Tina, we went out to the audience, is that correct? No, Madam Chair, okay. we didn't, but there's no one here wishing to speak on this item. Okay. We're ready for a motion. Well, we have a motion and we need a second. Second. No, I'm you sorry. Motion, you did the motion. That was on the last one. Okay. So we Who need a motion. motion. We do need a motion. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Did you get both of those? Thank you. Uh, this is a roll call. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Council Member Driscoll? Yes. Vice Mayor Smith? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Yes. Commissioner Long? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Council Member Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion, motion carries, and we will now go on to the Pine Hills Planning Council. We will move into the Pine, the Pine Hills Planning Council public hearings, which will be conducted as follows. We will first ask Ford Pinellas staff to present the item. The applicant local governments are available for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, we will then ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally, any other citizen who wishes to speak or ask questions of the case. We will then hear rebuttal from the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions, and then we will close the public hearing, and the board will deliberate and take action. Our first case will be presented by Rodney Chapman. It is 6C1, case CW22-12, which is in the city of Clearwater. And staff member from the city of Clearwater, Kyle Brotherton, will be here too. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have three cases for your consideration today. The reason I'm up here is Nafshin is on vacation. So I am stepping in in her place. And so the first case, again, is in the city of Clearwater. The action is uh, to amend the uh, countywide plan map from retail and services to activity center. Uh, there is a parcel, two parcels of land on US 19, where uh, there is an annexation underway, and part of the annexation requires the application of zoning and land use uh, categories for the subject property. Uh, we talked a little bit about Sunset Point Road. Um, Earlier today, and this property is at the intersect southeast corner of the intersection of Sunset Point Road and US 19. You see Sunset Point Road here and US 19 here. Property is a little over six acres on the east side. Those of you that are familiar with the area know that to the north there is a commercial node, uh, both to the north and then uh, to the northwest. There is also multifamily across US 19 to the west, as well as uh, commercial here to the south, and there's single family residential here uh, to the east. Um, these are two images of the current state of the subject property, again, being vacant, uh, and the frontage road there uh, along US 19. Uh, again, the current category of this property is retail and services. You see that identified in the red boundary there. Uh, there is a host of commercial retail uses that are allowed currently. Um, as uh, the property exists in unincorporated Pinellas County. Uh, when the property is annexed uh, into the city of Clearwater, the city intends to add this, par par excuse me, this parcel to their US-19 activity center, which uh, had several goals, which include establishing uh, the US-19 corridor as a jobs and uh, residential corridor, and this action is consistent with that. And lastly, uh, we determined that this uh, category is uh, appropriate for uh, this location and the intended use, and we found it consistent with the relevant countywide considerations. Uh, are there any questions? Oh. Any questions for Rodney? Yes, um, Commissioner Edwards. Have you, have you seen uh, since the state passed um, certain... Uh, right, I guess uh, 
issues, things up in Tallahassee that said that uh, cities can uh, basically ignore the comp plan as it relates to um, housing and industrial zoned areas. Have you s seen that start to happen? Are we starting to lose some of our areas of uh, job, supposed to be job oriented right. uh, to residential? I think the pressure is 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 building. Um, I've heard from some of the local planning staff uh, that are telling us that they're having inquiries from the development community, and those inquiries have stepped up. And that's um, I think St. Petersburg in particular is is feeling that heat more because of the demand uh, is greater probably in St. Petersburg for for housing to be built, and the city of St. Petersburg did kind of, um, well, they, I think, did a really good job creating a path for that to happen, uh, at least in terms of the House Bill 1339 from 2020. Um, I don't think you've yet taken on the new bill and what that means uh, in the city of St. Petersburg. Maybe you can address that. Uh, well, we have, in fact, had one committee meeting about right. that. Um, I mean, at the time, the bill hadn't even been signed yet. Right. So um, we just directed staff essentially to go out and start doing the outreach, and then sometime this fall, it will come back to our housing right. committee. You don't have a, a formulated no. policy yet. No. But I, I know Largo and uh, Unincorporated Pinellas County and the city of Clearwater have expressed to us that they are hearing from the development community who are starting to inquire about um, mixed-use projects and housing projects in industrial and employment lands. So basically, is so it's without regard to the countywide plan. That's right. People can move forward. It's up to the local governments. Right. Yeah. So in unincorporated, it's up to Pinellas County, and, and obviously the cities, it's up, up to them. Yeah, and, and, you know, we can't make anybody wait, but we have asked our staff, and I know some of the local government staff uh, have expressed a desire to wait until our target employment industrial land study is complete to provide that better policy framework for those decisions to be made. And that'll be complete this year, um, so before the end of the year. And you know, um, we we hope that we can hold off those applications until after that study is complete. You start to see properties like this that would be otherwise available primarily to retail and office. And now the switching to to it would be okay switching to. Apartments, had it, if we're not losing so much of the other right. stuff, that's why I asked the question. Right. Um, but, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tina, are there any proponents? Um, Madam Chair, we do not have any proponents, opponents, or other citizens wishing to be heard. However, the property owner's representative, Mr. Brian Onst Jr., is here in the audience for questions. Thank you. Is there anyone on the board who has any questions for either Rodney or for Mr. Unks? Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna close the public here. You do have a question. Julie? No, I said bless you. Oh. <laughs> it sounds like thank you. You know, that bless was good, you. thank you. Uh, looking for a motion? Did you get that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Rodney? That would uh, thank be you. Uh, the next case. Yes, the next case is also in the city of Clearwater, a little bit of a different uh, case. This action would amend the countywide plan map from public, semi public to residential low medium. And the purpose of this is to facilitate the purchase of property by the Habitat for Humanity from the city of Clearwater to develop uh, workforce housing uh, just north of downtown. Uh, the map here shows uh, the location of the subject property is just off the Pinellas Trail, again, just north of uh, downtown. Uh, the properties are currently vacant, and uh, the surrounding uses are a mix of uh, single-family residential, multifamily residential, and um, some institutional uses to the south. Uh, here's an image of the current state of the uh, property. Uh, again, just another aerial image of the surrounding uses. Again, on the countywide plan map, the current category is public semi-public, which will reflect the public ownership of uh, the, the current properties. 
and this action would uh, amend the countywide plan map to residential low medium to facilitate the approval and construction of those workforce housing uh, dwellings. Uh, we've determined that this uh, category meets the intended purpose and, and is uh, appropriate for the desired uh, uses given the locational characteristics and we recommend approval. Are there any questions? I also want to make mention that uh, from the Clearwater staff is Dylan Prince, in case anyone has any questions for him. And at that's, this time, Tina, are there any proponents? No, Madam Chair, there's no one. Uh, proponents, opponents, or other citizens requesting to speak for this uh, public hearing item. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing. Any other questions from the board? If not, is there a motion? Move approval. Did you get that? Second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We'll move on to item 6C3. And this is the City of Dunedin staff. Francis Sharp is here for questions too. Yes. Uh, this case in this is in the City of Dunedin. This is a request to amend the countywide plan map from public semi-public to recreation open space. And the purpose behind this amendment is to uh, add this additional, add this property to a hammock park. Uh, the property is um, at 1900 San Mateo Drive. It's just to the east of a Catholic school. Uh, the properties were formerly owned by the St. Petersburg Diocese, and the city uh, over the past several years has acquired those uh, through uh, grants from the Florida Communities Trust. And part of that uh, process required that the zoning and land use ch uh, be changed to reflect the, the recreation open space nature of the property upon um, transfer, and this action facilitates that. Uh, so again, uh, Hammock Park is up in this location. Here's the Catholic school, and the subject properties are over in this location. Again, uh, the current categories are public, semi-public shown here in blue, and uh, with uh, the change in the map category, it would then turn to green to recreation open space. We determined, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, the property is also uh, partly in the coastal high hazard area, but obviously with changing the category from public, semi-public to recreation open space, uh, there would be no residential allowances uh, available, uh, so that negates any impacts to the coastal high hazard area. Uh, therefore, uh, we are recommending approval of this uh, amendment as well. Are there any questions? Tina, are there any proponents? No, Madam Chair, there are no proponents, opponents, or citizens to be heard on this case. We will close the public hearing, and uh, is there anyone on the board who has any other questions for Rodney? I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. Okay. This is the eight acres that the county helped us purchase with Hammock Park a few years back. Um, and for whatever reason, with transition of staff and stuff, the, the actual change in zoning didn't occur at that time. Okay. So. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Did you get that? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we will go on to presentations and or action items. And first we will start with 7A with Council Member Driscoll with PSTA. Thank you. The PSTA board last met on May 25th, 2022. Um, some of the highlights include our the federal grant program of projects where Annually, PSTA receives federal dollars to support our capital program through a formula program. And then these funds are allocated and um, they're based on revenue vehicle miles, population, and density. The, um, there are other grants that are programmed through this, including discretionary competitive grants that PSTA might receive over the year. Um, the FTA requires that all grantees like PSTA publish a list of projects it proposes to fund with its annual apportionments and provide an opportunity for public comment. For this year, PSTA will receive $20.3 million in formula funding. 
and $19.7 million in discretionary awards, the vast majority of, vast majority of which are from um, the FTA bus and bus facilities grant for about 12 new electric vehicles and related charging infrastructure. The PSTA board approved the expenditure of these funds on a program of projects that also includes passenger amenities, transit vehicle hardware and software, mobility management support, planning activities such as the upcoming transit development plan and the Clearwater Inter Intermodal Center. Um, regarding the Sunrunner Rising Development Study, just as we heard that um, the recommendations and accepted it here in Fort Pinellas, the PSTA board also approved the acceptance of this report. Um, upcoming community events include Juneteenth and Pride, which PSTA will be an, an, ex, an enthusiastic participant in each. And then um, PSTA will also be um, out uh, showing off the bus wraps, and they have a unique bus wrap for each of those uh, wonderful celebrations. So um, ending on, on that positive note, the next board meeting will be on June 29th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Driscoll. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll move on to 7B, T. Barda, T. Barda and Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so at our last board meeting, uh, we continued to talk about the CSX quarter passenger rail study to evaluate the need between Brooksville and Clearwater subdivisions. But CSX has notified TBARTA as well as um, FDOT that they are no longer interested in selling the tracks or allowing passenger rail service on them. So after much discussion, uh, the board decided to review the topic during the July policy committee meeting. Um, we had a very clean audit. It was an unmodified opinion with no material weaknesses or deficiencies. We approved a DBA, DBE program and staff recommended a goal of 2%. TBARTA has been exempt from needing a program because it hadn't met the 250,000 annual contracting threshold that FTA imposes. But anticipated, in anticipation of possibly exceeding that threshold, we thought it was a good idea to put a program in place. Unfortunately, t -Barta's funding has been vetoed again by the governor. Obviously, this is very frustrating to all of us because we can, though we continue to be included in the legislative budget, we don't get the same level of support from the governor's office. We did have very strong support from the community, particularly for regional service for the transportation disadvantaged that we wanted to start again. And dozens of people contacted the governor's office on t behalf, but to no avail. Uh, work continues on the US 19 regional BRT study. The team has narrowed their options to two alternatives, high cost and low cost, and 16 station locations. They're currently developing a concept of operation and completing 10% design and are targeting August 26 to present a recommendation to t -Barta's board. The city of Clearwater selected two possible downtown terminal locations, so the team is completing technical work on those preferred alignments, which I'm very happy about. It's only taken them about three and a half years to get this thing going. They're developing cost estimates and evaluating financial options. They're going to present to t -Barta and Forward Pinellas CAC and Amplify Clearwater in September and then forward to us here. So you'll be hearing more about that, uh, I believe, in October. The FTA approved a documented categorical exclusion for the environmental work. The team will spend the rest of the summer completing a social cultural analysis and then will coordinate with the State Historic Preservation Office. 
They are targeting a final presentation to T-Barton's board in November, and that's on the regional BRT. And that completes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Anyone have any questions for Commissioner Long? Hearing none, we'll move on to item 7C, which is the Regional Rapid Transit Concept of Operations, and it'll be presented by Brian Pizarro of T. Barda, followed by Scott Pringle. Did I get all those names right? You did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brian Pissarro. I'm a principal planner with T-BARDA. I'm also the project manager of the I-275 Regional Rapid Transit Study. With me today is Scott Pringle from WSP. He is the, pro he is the consultant project manager on this study. In August of 2021, the T-BARDA board approved the locally preferred alternative for the Regional Rapid Transit. As Scott will show you in a moment, the LPA consists of nine stations total. So there's four in Pinellas, three in Hillsboro, and two in Pasco. The RRT, it's going to operate in a mix of dedicated uh, bus lanes on the interstate on the right side shoulder. Across the Howard Franklin Bridge, it would be operating in, in the tolled express lanes, and then in other locations, it would operate in mixed traffic. Since the board approved the LPA, W.S. Scott and his team have been working on the concept of operations for the RRT. So what are the routes? How frequent is the service? What's the time span of the service? How many buses are we, we going to need to operate it? That's what we're here to give you a presentation on today. Also, our board has expressed an interest in using battery electric buses for the RRT service, and so Scott is going to brief you on some of their analysis about that as well. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members. Scott Bringle with WSP. Uh, Brian did an amazing job introducing where we are with the project, so I'm going to go ahead and get into the presentation itself. Uh, this is our purpose statement. We present this at every presentation we ever give associated with the Regional Rapid Transit Project. Um, regional, frequent, reliable, and modern has been the driving force behind this project from the beginning. As Brian indicated, uh, last year we brought forward to the t -Barta board a recommendation for a locally preferred alternative. So that is essentially where the stations are, where the project is envisioned to be constructed. Um, we spent quite a bit of time uh, last year discussing that locally preferred alternative at the t -Barta board. Uh, we did a lot of uh, additional comparisons to make sure that what was being adopted was acceptable to the board itself. Um, and what you see on your slide here is that adopted locally preferred alternative as presented to the t -Barta board last year. What's important about this locally preferred alternative is it allowed us to then go forth and start coordinating with the Federal Transit Administration to begin our environmental work. We needed this locally preferred alternative in place before we could even go and have any conversations with FTA. And as Commissioner Long just introduced, uh, we have been working with them quite successfully um, and we're on a good path with FTA to get our environmental work completed. Um, instead of going through and describing the, all the different components of the LPA, we do have a video which does a much better job of describing it than I ever will. So I'll go ahead and play that. So as you can see, that's the entire length of the corridor with the nine stations that Brian introduced. those stations that we're proposing along the length of the corridor, none of them are in the interstates. Every single one of them are at street level in the communities themselves. This is an illustration of aspirationally what we'd like the station design to look like. Again, I think the importance here is identifying and signifying to the riding public this is something much different than they've experienced in terms of uh, express bus service in the past. Uh, obviously, a big part of this project is complementing local initiatives, not competing with them. Um, so making that direct connection to the Sunrunner is a, is a really big and important part of this project, a real, uh, an important benefit to provide that regional connectivity to the Sunrunner in downtown St. Pete and St. Pete Beach. 
As we move north along the corridor, the design concept is to use the outside shoulders for a dedicated busway. The pilot program is already out there and looking at the express, uh, express bus services when traffic is congested. The difference here is that that would memorialize that shoulder for use for transit all day long. Now when we go across the Howard Franklin Bridge, we're just in the express lanes as proposed and being constructed by the department. We do have an opportunity to actually get off the interstate and go straight to the airport uh, and connect into the Consolidated Rental Car Center or the Conrack Center. At that point, we would enter back into 275, but from this point forward, from West Shore to downtown Tampa, there's no special treatment for transit. We're just using the lanes as they're proposed and exist today, so it would be mixed with general traffic. So we get to downtown Tampa, again, jumping off the interstate, hopefully making a connection to a downtown intermodal center in downtown Tampa. And just like in Pinellas, when we head out of Tampa, uh, roughly when we get past MLK, heading towards the university, again, we would like to do those outside shoulders. It gives us great access to the stations along the way. Um, it's safe operations and really gives that transit service a preferential treatment to bypass congestion all the way through Hillsborough, USF area to the campus. We have a deviation that can connect directly to the university and then onwards into Pasco where we've got two stations at 56 and 54. So hopefully that gave you a little better idea of what that locally preferred alternative is. Um, but as Brian introduced, uh, the one thing I wanted to talk to you uh, this afternoon is how this service would operate. Uh, a very common misconception when I'm, I'm, I'm going around the region and giving this presentation to folks is the thought that you've got this long corridor, 40, 41 miles, all the way from St. Pete, all the way up to Wesley Chapel, and that it's just one service that's running from St. Pete all the way up to Wesley Chapel and back. Um, that is actually not true. What we've been looking at is creating an operating plan that specifically serves the different travel markets along that long corridor. So there's actually four different routes that could operate within the 275 alignments. Um, you can see that here. When we're looking at diesel hybrid buses, we're thinking about 22 diesel vehicles to run the service. Um, and we have what we call a combined highest frequency of a service coming every seven and a half minutes. But that's really where we have uh, overlap between three different routes, which is really between West Shore and downtown Tampa. Uh, it was important to T-Barta to make sure the service was running early in the morning and late in the evening so that we have opportunities not just for folks traveling nine to five jobs, but for uh, B-shift workers as well. Um, and the nice thing about this operating pattern is we are, we do have the ab ability to give a one seat ride from folks in Wesley Chapel straight to downtown Tampa. And we do have a one seat ride from downtown St. Pete all the way to downtown Tampa. And like I mentioned in the video, we do have these deviations from the corridor. We can get straight to the airport or make a direct connection to USF as well. So a little bit more about these four routes. Route A is really focused during the peak every 15 minutes between 54 all the way to West Shore. Um, and you can see the stations serve there. And while that's running every 15 minutes during the peak, every hour we're going to go straight to the airport. Uh, Route B is the off-peak connecting uh, Wesley Chapel directly to the USF area. And again, this is a reflection of what the data is telling us in terms of how people move along that corridor. And again, this is a great opportunity to get folks from Pasco to opportunities at the university and a direct connection to the university itself. Now, when we look at Route C, this is really focused between USF and downtown West Shore. Uh, this would be uh, uh, during the off-peak period. We're looking at 15-minute service during the off-peak. Again, have that opportunity for that hourly connection to the airport. 
And the last route, but probably the most important route, because uh, it's really where the core of our ridership is along this corridor, is connecting St. Pete to downtown Tampa. And what we're looking at is 15-minute service all day long, uh, with no changes between peak and off-peak. Uh, you can see the stations that are served there. And again, we got the opportunity to connect to the Sunrunner, opportunity to get directly to the airport, and of course, to downtown Tampa. So as Brian mentioned, we've also then, you know, once we have the LPA, <clears throat> know what the project is, know roughly how we want to operate the project, then the next question was, well, what vehicles are we using? So we've had a couple of meetings with the T-BART board um, and looked at the opportunity to go all electric. I really do uh, uh, want to com uh, commend uh, PSDA for really taking a leadership role <clears throat> in moving that uh, vehicle, electric vehicle fleet forward. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially when we're looking at the timeline for construction of this project. We're roughly looking about 2030 to be up and running. The change in battery technology between now and then will be significant, and I think we can capture that moving forward. So what we did is we actually looked at what would that mean in terms of our operating plan, and what we found is that because of the charging needs, uh, we can run the same four service route pattern with about 14 additional electric vehicles uh, above the 22 that we identified up front, or we can do some on-route charging, which would uh, limit our amount of additional vehicles down to seven, but we would, of course, have to have that infrastructure in place to do charging while the bus is in service. Uh, the T-BARTA board was very interested in this concept, and we definitely want to make that part of the proposal moving forward. So with that, that concludes the update. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come out and give this update. I know we haven't had a chance to talk to this board since prior to the LPA adoption. So at that point, we'll take any questions. Any questions for Scott or Brian? Commissioner Seal. Um, and Commissioner Long may want to address this, but um, how has the T-Board of Bard unanimously back this at this point? Um, we did have approval of a local preferred alternative last year. Uh, there definitely still is a lot of conversations coming from Hillsborough County. Um, and a lot of the dialogue that we actually, you know, and I'm just being frank, a lot of the conversations that we had last year related to the locally preferred alternative as it stands today was um, addressing the comments coming from Hillsborough County, meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, making adjustments to the number of stations. You, we had several more stations in the LPA for Hillsborough County than what's shown now. We only have the three, um, and that was per the county's concerns, and we're addressing those. Um, so we, we felt like we had done a good job running the data and addressing the comments we were getting from Hillsborough County. Um, but, you know, as we move forward, you know, the question is whether or not the county, Hillsborough County, will move towards actually uh, supporting funding for this project. Sorry, just, uh, <laughs> let me just add to that. So I had mentioned that it was at the August 21 meeting that the t Barta board um, adopted the LPA. Unfortunately, I'd say that with an asterisk behind it. On the one hand, we had a quorum at the August meeting, and it was a unanimous vote supporting the LPA. However, Hillsborough County was not present at that meeting, so they were not there to vote. So, yes, on the one hand, it was a unanimous vote of the T-BARTA board. Hillsborough County was not there. I will add, though, and this I think this was in your packet, at the December 2021 TMA leadership meeting, there was a vote on regional priorities. And it was a unanimous vote that the RRT is a regional priority. Hillsborough County was present at that meeting, and they did not vote against it. So I guess that's my roundabout way of saying it's, it's complicated. So how does it relate to their desire to use CSX? <laughs> um, I mean, I believe that they have long, they've, they've long been interested in exploring the CSX um, for the possibility of passenger rail. Um, I think when it comes down to the two between the RRT and the CSX, I think the Hillsborough County's uh, position is that they place a higher value or priority on passenger rail. Commissioner Long. So as you know, Commissioner Seal, the issue of the CSX rail is being driven by one individual the state has already said they will not pay 
for any effort to put rail on tracks that are leased and CSX has no desire to sell those tracks. Secondly, um, gosh, a decade ago, we dealt with this in the legislature. They were horrible partners. They don't maintain the tracks. They want the governments that are involved in the partnership to pay the entire maintenance on everything and assume the liability for trains and tracks that are horribly antiquated. And in the world we live in today, there's just not even a little eeny teeny bit of me that would support this effort because why on earth would we rely on technology that's already 50 to 75 years old when every couple of years pu public transportation options are changing on a dime because of the advancements in technology? Right, Whit? There's truth to that. So. Thank you. I just wanted more clarification because I sort of knew this, but it was, <laughs> let's get it out and air it. Well, fish that we have to fry in terms of regional, Scott, Brian, is now that the governor has vetoed the, our appropriation at T-BARDA, coupled with the fact that he has never fulfilled the appointments to the board that he's supposed to be putting on there, I'm very anxious to have the conversation about where do we go from here and with what. By the way, who's going to pay for it? Because all of, in the statute, all of the partners that are indicated by statute that have to participate, are we all going to be on the hook? That's going to be an interesting question to answer. Thanks. I, I just had a couple of questions for either Brian or, or Scott. Uh, have you given this concept of operations presentation to the Hillsborough TPO and the Hillsborough Board of County Commissioners? Just curious. Um, I offered to give, we offered to give this presentation to all three MPOs. Um, I believe it was last month we were up in Pasco County and gave it to the Pasco MPO. I had extended um, an invitation to, or I offered to Beth that we come to the Hillsborough MPO. She recommended that instead we give it to the Transportation Disadvantage Coordinating Board. Uh, and that's, so that is what I will be doing uh, I believe it's next month. Okay. So the board has expressed over there no interest in even hearing this. Is that fair? That is, that's, that's fair. I mean, through the staff, right? Through staff, yes. Okay. And then the second question I had, I read in the newspaper maybe a few months ago that Hillsborough County commissioners, uh, particularly the TPO members um, who've generally opposed this project, have been... Um, very happy to encourage you to look at the Suncoast and Veterans Parkway instead of I-275 as an alignment option. Uh, did you look at that as an alignment option? Does that make any sense whatsoever compared to I-275? And can you, yeah. can you address how you responded to those sure. comments? Um, I, I can respond to that with a couple points in no particular order. Um, the general route for the, IR, for the RRT on 275 didn't just fall out of the sky. This was an alignment that was initially identified in the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. That was the precursor to this study. There's nothing to say that we could not also look at the Suncoast Parkway as another route, but to say, kill this study and let's shift our attention to the, to the Suncoast instead. I guess my, what my response to that would be is, We've been working on this, like I said, it was identified in the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. We've been working on this study since May of 2019. It's a $5 million study, which we've almost spent all the money of, to flush all of that money down the toilet and say, let's start over and go to the Sun Coast instead. To me, that would be a tremendous waste of money. I don't think we're at the, it is definitely an uphill battle with Hillsborough County. There's no, I mean, that, that's common knowledge. Whether or not we've hit a wall and this project is just dead in the water, I can't say that to you today. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is working to our favor in some way is, you know, this project is tied to the TB Next schedule, and because of the, the different construction phases for TB Next, we're looking at about 2030 is when we would actually be in operations with the RRT. I mean, FDOT can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 2030 is around the time frame when the interchange and the piece between West Shore and downtown will be done. 
So that was, that was probably about the earliest we would see the RRT in operations. So what I'm trying to say is that buys us some time to work out these problems with Hillsborough County. Sorry, Brian. Yes. If, I could, if I could just add to that, too. Um, apologies. Um, you know, getting the locally preferred alternative last year passed by the board, like I mentioned before, allowed us to begin that conversation with FTA. You know, there's still progress being made on this concept. While we may not have a solution on funding, like Brian indicated, we maybe do have some time to get that flushed out. But when we get done with this project, you'll have a project, you'll know the cost, you'll know how it's operated, and you'll have environmental clearance from the federal government. You're ready to go to get, get federal funding with a very quick turnaround when that time is ready. And, and can I just follow up real quick before Commissioner Long? Have, and, and it's my understanding that you have not presented the local share of this project cost, either for capital or operating, to any of the counties? Or am I wrong about that? It was at one of the board meetings, and I cannot remember which month it was. We did, I believe one of Scott's presentations, did have a, a possible formula for how we would split it out among the counties. There was a, obviously a lot of heated discussion about that. And I think where we ended up at, by the end of that board meeting was that we still need to come up with what is the, the correct solution for trying to identify what is Pasco's share, what is, Hills, what okay. is Hillsborough's, and what is Pinellas. And Mike, is that correct? Any? Okay, all right, thank you. My turn? Yes. Okay, so nothing rings my bell more than when I hear we have plenty of time to flush this out. So members of the board, did you hear 2030? 2030, it's 2022. We are already in gridlock here. And we have talked throughout this meeting about more development, we know ARCO is going to be totally develop, developed. We're constantly talking and focusing on development, redevelopment. And, you know, I, I just sit here and say, we are missing the boat here when we are not leaning all over our congressional people to find ways to figure out at the federal level how you um, expedite funding from the feds. Because Scott, I am telling you there is no quick turnaround to get the federal money. It is a six year time frame all day long. And you know, if you're not if you're not laying the groundwork with the relationships in Washington, Commissioner Seal knows this. How long did it take you to get 19, Commissioner Seal, um, you've got to build the relationships and you've got to focus on the reality. When I was last in DC, it was just two months ago, um, I listened intently to Secretary Buttigieg and I was so thrilled to hear him say, we want to know what your ideas are to help speed up the money. They have got plenty of money that they're trying to get out and into the communities. And they want to know from us, what can they expedite? What piece can they tweak? What changes can they make? I don't hear anybody talking about that from the guys doing the studies, from you, Brian. I don't hear anyone talking about coming up with ideas to help them. We're the ones that should be helping them. We're the ones that are trying to put these projects and build them to completion. But when you say 2030 is the soonest we can get this done, I'm sorry. That's not good enough. We've been working on it already for 50 years. 50 years. First time I ever saw a transportation study for this region was in 1970, and it was from the Regional Planning Council. It's 2000 and 2022. And you know what? If we can't get Hillsborough to play ball, why can't we just go north and south? Have any of you been over the Skyway Bridge recently? Talk to Secretary Nandam down there. He'll knock your socks off with what their issues are. Whit even said in 2006, he spoke to their county commission and told them 
they could not pay for the development that they were authorizing. Guess what? They did it anyway. You cross the Skyway, I was just down there three days ago, on both sides of the road, right through Manatee County, huge developments, subdivisions. Low density. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but don't get my cell <laughs> I do want to respond to the, 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 the 2030 question. Put aside the issue of Hillsborough County, just forget about it for a moment. What makes the RRT a cost-effective project, what has always made it a cost-effective project, is that FDOT is going to be absorbing quite a bit of the infrastructure costs through their TBNEXT program. If it wasn't for TBNEXT, it is unlikely that the RRT would be a competitive project in the FTA's eyes. That's my way of saying that, for better or for worse, we, the RRT is tied to the TBNEXT schedule. There is nothing that TBARDA can do to accelerate the TBNEX schedule. They have to go hand in hand. And I, I want to make it clear to this board that uh, this isn't the only transit solution in the corridor. PSTA has its next high priority project is to operate uh, express bus service from downtown St. Petersburg to Tampa International Airport that would potentially go on to downtown. So that's the 727 and, and the department would be a, a, a funding partner. Yeah, it's, it's probably a better transit market right now. Mayor Brzezowski, did you want to say something? Microphone, please. Mayor Brzezowski, your mic. When you talk about the operating, who are, who are you looking to operate it? At the, I believe it was the November 2020 board meeting, which we had back at the airport, the board had made the T-Barda board had made it clear that they were not interested in T-Barda being an owner operator with its own bus drivers and its own buses. That they would contract the service out um, either through one of the the local transit agencies or through a private operator. They did not make a decision whether it would be public or private, okay. but they did make it clear that their vision of T-Barda when the day ever comes where we're actually operating bus service, it would be through a third party. Okay, thank you. Um, and then WIT, we have that meeting on Friday. Yes, we do. So are any of these items going to be discussed on Friday? Um, I don't, like I don't. Like the CXX, like the CSX? The CSX will probably have some discussion. Um, we are, uh, just to be real clear, Friday's meeting is the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance in a joint meeting with the uh, Central Florida MPO Alliance. For the joint <clears throat> meeting, I don't think we're gonna get too far into those details, but it does provide an opportunity to share what uh, our respective regions are doing with regard to um, CSX, with regard to uh, regional transit, because the Orlando region is actually doing quite a lot. So should we be having uh, this presentation at the TMA, the next TMA? Well, um, we've had this presentation or something similar at the TMA leadership group, and uh, the TMA continues to keep it on the priority list. But, I mean, if you want to have some real fireworks, we can certainly go back and present this. Well, I'm, I'm saying given what's happening with the CSX. That's right. what I'm saying. I mean, I think that CSX it discussion... Might, it might, you know, bring everybody's mind back to what other alternatives We absolutely available. need to have the discussion about the CSX, uh, and that will be an ongoing topic at the TMA and at the SCTPA. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have that at this coming TMA meeting, which would be great because I won't be there, um, <laughs> if we can have it then instead of later? I'm kidding, but it just seems... We, we really don't have a substantive TMA leadership group meeting. They're just being invited to, to join in on the SCTPA actions. They only meet twice a year at the SCTPA level, so I think it would be more of an in-depth conversation for the TMA at the fall meeting. Um, Okay, yeah. I was just looking up um, the term having your cake and eat it too. And, and it seems like whenever we have these discussions, there's, there's a missing partner. Uh, and there's always a, a and it, it was even an issue, if you remember, when we made the motion here to make this I-275 State Road 60 interchange a priority. A few years ago, the state said, 
make one project your priority and speak as a as a unified area. And um, guess who was last on board? Uh, Hillsborough County was last on board to agree to it. We finally got everybody on board together, and it, and it passed, and we got that money here instead of going wherever else it would have gone. So again, we start working together. I think things work, and I and I'm, I'm wondering why we don't have a little little you know uh, route to our own. Pi Airport. I mean, for crying out loud, you're doing the Tampa Airport. I mean, it just seems. Well, to clarify, I, mean, I don't again, disagree with you, Dave. I, I think you're right. I'm Be just. I'm, I'm being a little bit serious and a little facetious. That I mean, at least we're on board, right. and you know, our airport. You know, we're on yeah. board. They're not, and and I think they would like to have the airport included. They want the things that they want included included, and the things that they don't not. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I meant by having your cake and eat it too. It's really a, it's a collective effort. Yeah. So anyway, so there is no service right now to um, the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport, but the regional rapid transit in the U.S. 19 corridor does have an alignment. T-BART is looking at that, and we met a couple of weeks ago and identified a priority or a preference for the East Bay Roosevelt alignment that goes right by the airport that would tie into the airport. That's Pasco to Pinellas. I, I know. Council Member Driscoll, well you have been waiting so patiently. Thank you, and I did <laughs> request to speak, so I appreciate that. Um, my question is about the dedicated lanes. It's interesting that you're using a combination of dedicated and regular lanes. I have heard a couple of times concerns um, about what those dedicated lanes would mean in terms of nearby homes, businesses, churches, um, but there wouldn't be any kind of disruption or demolition or taking of property in doing so because I think you said you're expanding the shoulders, correct? Correct. You know, and the shoulders now vary. I mean, anywhere between 8 and 14 feet. Um, and what we're proposing is a 16-foot shoulder, 12-foot for the transit vehicles, 4-foot for drainage spread during the rain in the afternoon. Um, that can be wholly contained within the existing state right away with quite a bit of uh, feet to spare. So it would not infringe on any private property. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important that that message be communicated whenever you can in any public forum so that there are not any misconceptions about what's happening and what's not. Understood, thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation um, and for um, joining us and presenting everything in a very sophisticated and um, um, user-friendly manner. The, the tour, so to speak, was a, a really great way to take people inside what this is going to look like. And I, I appreciate the forward thinking that you have. Um, it's quite refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for coming today. You know, I just, I just want to say um, I appreciate our county commissioners and the amount of expertise and experience that they have. Yeah, I think that today I've been doing this, I feel like 30 years, and I learned so much from the three of them today. And um, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the job that you guys are doing. I, I don't have a dog in anybody's fight. I just want you, I just wanted to say that. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, item 7D, Downtown St. Petersburg Mobility Study. Miss Christina. I thought we were going to let uh, Chair Driscoll lead this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> she joked to enough. me that she probably could by now. <laughs> probably heard it enough times by now. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a video today. I wish I did, make it more exciting. But um, sorry, we just have some pretty graphics. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Mendoza. I'm a principal planner with Ford Pinellas. Today, I'm here to provide you with an overview of the downtown St. Pete mobility study, the analysis that we've done, and the project concepts and recommendations that we're including in our action plan. So a little over 
two years ago now. <laughs> uh, the city of St. Petersburg, FDOT, and Forward Pinellas came together to decide to fund a study uh, looking at the downtown network within St. Pete. It's been growing and changing a lot over the last couple of decades. There was really a need to re-examine the network and, uh, and determine how to um, potentially improve it. So we defined a vision for the study that looked at safety, accessibility, multimodal connectivity, and vibrancy. Uh, we tested improvement strategies against a set of performance measures, including mobility, livability, and economic vitality measures. Based on that, we identified projects and programs that we wanted to advance to further study. We did an extensive existing conditions analysis as part of this project. Uh, we learned that the current population within downtown St. Pete is about 30,000 people. We project that to grow to about 45,000 by the year 2045. We learned that the current employment is about 45,000 jobs in downtown, and we project that to grow to about 58,000 by 2045. We also looked at doing a crash, we did a crash analysis in downtown and we learned that about 43% of all crashes in downtown occur on the one-way pairs. And that makes up about 17% of the network in downtown. We also did a very extensive public engagement component for this project. We had about four broad phases of outreach. Uh, the first phase, we essentially gathered initial input and feedback from the public uh, that we used to develop a set of project scenarios that we tested and we refined further and then brought back to the public several times for additional feedback and input. Uh, and then essentially we used all that input to develop our recommendations. Overall, we had over 10 community conversations. We had over 1,000 comment board views. We did nine listening sessions. We had over 1,000 survey responses and we did four surveys. We also did an extensive case study analysis. We learned that generally two-way streets are safer than one-way streets. They can improve business accessibility and they can promote more livable communities. You have more eyes on the street with a two-way street. You've got cars moving in two different directions uh, and you've got generally slower speeds. We were also looking at potential modifications and removal to um, the I-175 and 375 spurs as part of this project. So we did do a lot of case study research related to highway redesign. We learned that it can increase walking and biking. It can encourage economic opportunity. It can improve environmental quality. And it can increase neighborhood connectivity. We also spoke to Sunstar, which is the ambulance company here in the county. And they informed us that they are actually more concerned with the smoothness of the ride than travel time, because once a patient is in an ambulance, they've already started to receive care. But we also spoke to um, emergency response folks like the St. Pete Fire Department, as well as the hospitals, and they did express concerns related to accessibility as well as travel time. So that is definitely uh, something that we would need to consider moving forward. So now I'm gonna just provide a brief overview of the projects that we're including in our action plan. So we've divided the action plan into priority one and priority two projects. The priority one projects have been subdivided into short, mid, and long-term actions. Here you can see the mappable priority one projects that we've identified. On the map you can see the MLK and 8th Street and 3rd and 4th Street two-way conversion and lane reallocation projects, as well as the I-175 corridor modifications. So we'll start with the MLK and 8th Street two-way conversion and lane reallocation. Um, this project would essentially involve converting MLK and 8th Street from one-way pairs to two-way streets within downtown. They currently exist as two-way streets north and south of downtown, so that would be converting them, and then potentially allocating a portion of the roadway to bicycle and pedestrian facilities. In the short term, which would be a one to three year window, we recommend identifying concept plans and typical sections for the lane reallocation and two-way conversion. In the midterm, which would be about four to six years, we would recommend that the city advance the project into final phases based on the concept planning results. Uh, we are, I do wanna note that we're currently exploring funding opportunities for this next phase. It has not been funded yet. The city also developed a set of illustrative graphics uh, to, into, just to illustrate what this could look like. Uh, the number of lanes that you see on the screen here for each, for each street uh, is based on what was built into the model for our analysis. 
Uh, here you can see uh, this would feature a two-way cycle track with on-street parking on both sides, one lane in each direction with a two-way center turn lane to maximize capacity in the through lane. Again, this is just an example. The ultimate design would be uh, determined at a later phase. Question on that. Sure. Um, so that's what it is, that's what would be proposed. If it was a one-way, how many lanes of traffic would you have? With a one-way, it would be two, I believe, right? With a, with a one-way or a two-way? I'm one sorry. One-way. With one-way. For these for two roads? One? I think they're, they're four they're lanes. They're currently four now, They're yes. four in each direction. Mm -hmm. and, that, and if it stayed that way, that's the way it would, there wouldn't be any adjustment there. We yeah, just, the, what we really looked at was converting it to a two-way street. Is that feasible? We didn't really look at reallocating the one-way street configuration. No, I was just curious. You're adding lanes of, of looks like bike lanes and... And, that would be re reallocating some of the roadway space. It, it has no effect on right of way. So you'd be still working within the curb. And still moving the same number of uh, cars. You'd still move the same number of cars. What we found in this analysis is that traffic didn't shift to another roadway. It stayed in, in the roadway at capacity or below yes. capacity. Thank you. Yes. This is just another example that the city developed. This one's just one scenario. Uh, it features a two-way cycle track with on-street parking on both sides, and that should actually say two lanes in one direction and one in the other direction for a total of three lanes in each direction combined across the pair, which is a little confusing to picture, so we wanted to show it. Uh, but again, this will be studied further uh, in the next phase, and the ultimate design would be based on that. So we'll move on to the third and fourth straight two-way conversion and lane reallocation. Very similar to 8th and 9th, this would involve converting uh, 3rd and 4th to two-way streets within downtown, as well as allocating a portion of the roadway for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So in the short term, we would recommend identifying concept plans and typical sections for this lane reallocation and two-way conversion. And in the midterm, the city would work with FDOT to advance the project into final phases based on the concept planning results. Uh, the city could work in partnership with FDOT to explore funding opportunities for the next phase. We also included transit traffic and safety projects uh, in the action plan. Um, in the short term, we recommend that we do a traffic signal priority analysis to explore options to maintain or improve travel times and access to the hospitals, essentially to address some of the concerns that we were hearing. Um, we also recommend doing a study to evaluate safety and operations at the Iowa 275 at Fifth Avenue North interchange and the ramps, because there have been some safety concerns there. In the midterm, we recommend doing a transit service modification study that would essentially look at the transit network in downtown and how it could be improved based on these potential modifications uh, to the network. And then we also looked at potentially incorporating advancing technologies in downtown, such as connected vehicles and ITS, uh, to see how that could impact the network as well. Uh, we're also exploring funding opportunities for this next phase. So the next project I'm going to discuss is the I-175 corridor modifications. I'm sure many of you have already heard of this project. Essentially, uh, we looked at potentially modifying or removing the I-175 spur, as well as converting 4th and 5th Avenue south to two-way streets. We also looked at potentially modifying the interchange at 275 to maintain access to 5th Avenue south, as well as potentially incorporating additional connectivity to the TROP site. So in the short term, we recommend doing a conceptual development study to evaluate engineering options for 175. Uh, FTOT has already prepared a scope for this next phase. They have selected a consultant to develop a set of conceptual alternatives for the redevelopment of 175. Um, options that are being considered include a no-build scenario, modification, and removal. Uh, the consultant is going to provide three alternatives, uh, potential construction costs, traffic and traffic analysis for the anticipated LOS. Essentially, they're going to validate what we have done as part of this study to ensure that there's no fatal flaws from an engineering standpoint uh, for all of those alternatives. And based on the analysis that they do, they're going to bring those results back to the public to workshop it with them further to determine how we want to move forward. 
So additionally, uh, we do recommend doing a land use, urban design, and equity and transportation study uh, to evaluate options for 175 4th and 5th Avenue South. This would really be a community-driven effort to evaluate desires and determine next steps. Uh, it would involve looking at how the land could be repurposed or modified if the spur was to be removed or modified. Um, an example of that could be potentially incorporating affordable housing. We're also exploring funding opportunities for this next phase as well including the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program. This is a competitive grant program um, from the federal government. It's out of the, um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Essentially, uh, the purpose of it is to reconnect communities through the removal, modification, or mitigation of barriers, uh, such as transportation facilities that separate communities and can impact mobility and accessibility. The total funding amount for the grant is $1 billion. It can be used for construction, planning, or technical assistance. We expect the NOFA to be issued sometime in the near future. Uh, the feds actually hosted a uh, webinar and uh, providing an overview of the program and the application process a few weeks ago. So we think that hopefully that means that it will be coming soon. I, I just want to clarify for the board, we're not looking for $1 billion worth of no, funding. No, we're not. I that's the, that. that's no, the total not. amount <laughs> over total five amount. years. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have clarified that. No, we are not. So I'd also included some graphics here to really show um, the separation that the 175 spur really creates between downtown and the communities to the south. Here you can see the width of the right-of-way and the height of the berm as compared to the surrounding area. And in this graphic, you can really see the homes and businesses that were displaced as a part of the, as a, result of the construction of 175. We know that we can't bring these businesses and homes back, but we could potentially uh, make land available for affordable housing, or and we can incorporate bicycle and pedestrian connections to really activate the area and provide additional connectivity from the communities to the south, to the TROP site, and to downtown. And this really helps to build the case for why we think we have a compelling application for the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program. Additionally, we've also identified some um, midterm and long-term actions for the I-75 corridor modifications. These would be dependent on the results of the short-term actions, but they could potentially involve doing a PD&E study to evaluate options for 175, the ramps in 4th and 5th Avenue South, as well as the TROP connections. Um, it also could include doing a land dispossession strategy, which could look at how the land is transferred from DOT to the city. It would also, we could also do a 4th and 5th Avenue South two-way conversion study. And then some other studies that relate to the DOT process, like an interchange modification analysis, and then long-term actions, which would involve design, engineering, right-of-way, and construction. Also, as part of this study, we did look at potential modifications to 375. We looked at a partial or full removal. Um, but based on the analysis that we did and the public input that we received, we learned that this really isn't a priority right now. Uh, so we've listed it as a priority two project in the action plan with an extended term of about 15 plus years. Um, at that time, we would likely do a potential update to the downtown St. Pete mobility study. We would relook at the network, uh, determine what's feasible, um, if there's even an appetite for this type of project at that point in time. Um, and essentially, uh, if so, you know, we would potentially move forward with PD&E study, um, a land dispossession strategy, and some of the other projects related to do the DOT process. But that would all be determined at a later date. So essentially, this project was a very initial high-level look at the network in downtown to really determine um, concepts that are very much at a planning level. The I-175 core modifications and the two-way conversion and lane reallocation projects do have, appear to have public support at this time, so we're looking at next steps. Eventually, that could involve engineering and design or a project development and environmental study that could look at different alternatives. Throughout the whole process, though, there will be an extensive public engagement component all the way up to construction. So just some next steps. Uh, this has already gone to the St. Pete City Council. They have accepted the study. Uh, we've presented it to our committees, and now we're presenting it to the board. And this is an action item today. We're requesting uh, that you consider accepting the study as well as the action plan recommendations. So. I just I want to chime in and say I've been very pleased with the partnership we've had with FDOT 
on this. We went and met with uh, senior leadership in District 7 so that they weren't surprised when we started making presentations and they heard about all this. Uh, um, and, and they were very receptive to helping us solve the problems we were trying to solve and suggested the engineering feasibility study that they've now funded um, that's in its very initial stages. Uh, and that'll have a, a lot of public input uh, as it goes forward once they have that red flag analysis completed. Uh, and so I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really great opportunity to imagine what if in this corridor. And we may still have an interstate spur operating, but it may be in a smaller footprint, which frees up, you know, a couple hundred thousand square feet of space for, for desired development uh, or open space. I mean, a lot of things could be looked at in that footprint. Um, so again, it's, a, it's been a nice partnership between the city and FDOT on this and the community. Any questions from the board for Christina? Do you want to add anything, uh, Council Member Driscoll? Thank you. No, I um, think Christina did a wonderful job explaining it, and I know there's more, um, you know, more detail if you need it. But I can say that uh, the city overall seemed very pleased with the results of it, and it, it gave us some great ideas on how we can move forward, especially with 175 and the equity issue and the opportunities that would be created by making some adjustments there. Any the other, can, everybody's okay from St. Pete. Did you want to say anything? Yeah. Council Member Floyd? I'll add one thing uh, about 175 because I am excited to be able to literally tear down a barrier, but um, personally I've been advocating for us to take a deeper look other than just like the physical barrier. Um, Specifically, I'm, I have concerns about uh, which way development is and progress are going to um, move forward when we uh, remove that barrier. I mean, downtown with a lot of development, a lot of capital is right there. And uh, the other side of it is a majority African-American neighborhood with, um, I think, something like 70 percent renters. Um, and I just want to make sure that whatever comes forward from I-175 modifications or removal uh, keeps in mind that things like displacement could be a potential. And so um, I don't know that that's like incredibly valid today in here, but I just know that that's what I've been advocating to make sure that we pay attention to. But I'm really excited to see this. and. Uh, you know, maybe we'll need a billion dollars. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, enjoyed seeing that number. <laughs> I think some of your pastors from St. Pete got together too and, and were involved in some of the, you know, um, advocate advocating for the same things that you're talking about. Yeah, and I mean, I think this also goes into, um, you reminded me with the pastors, this also goes into, uh, you know, the future of Tropicana Field as right. well because it's right there next right. to it. So. Um, exciting times for our city and our, our county, so uh, I look forward to what we can come up with in the future. Thank you. Sure, why not? I'll <laughs> chime in. Lord knows we've had enough conversation about this in the city of St. Pete, so uh, might as well chime in here. Um, I completely agree. I mean, making sure that, you know, we're looking at this through an equity lens is going to be critically important for us as a city. Um, and I asked the question when it was at the committee level still of will this be part of the greater Tropicana field discussion and put into the actual um, master plan for Tropicana field. At that point, um, you know, staff was saying, Probably not. Um, it will probably be its own standalone, but will work collaboratively with the Tropicana Field Master Plan. So I think just making sure that all of those pieces are there, but critically important that we are tearing that down, we're reconnecting the grid, we're reconnecting that access is going to be very, very important for the future of our city. So I'm very excited and I'm glad that we're here today. Um, and I would move approval. Okay. Uh, before we do that, I would like to go out to Tina, and are, is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on the downtown St. Petersburg mobility study? No, Madam Chair, there is not. And we have a uh, first from uh, Council Member Gabbard, and who was the second? Council Member Council Driscoll. Member, 
Driscoll. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, are we, is the motion to accept the study? Um, because I, frankly, what I've found in um, at Tampa Bay Water, for instance, is we have something like this that's fairly complex, that we don't bring it just once for us to have a cursory overview and to accept what is in there as, as gospel. So I'd, I'd, I'd really rather just accept the study, or if you want to approve it, then I'd rather come back for another presentation. It's just me, right. just one person. So. We're, we're asking you to accept the, the, the completed planning study That's uh, and to endorse the action plan, which mm -hmm. doesn't commit this board or the city of St. Petersburg to any specific action other than moving into the next, supporting the next phase of, of feasibility. So there's uh, both for the one-way to two-way conversions, there would need to be an engineering design analysis done, um, and that would also have public input. And then for the I-175 piece, um, that's the engineering feasibility study that's currently underway. So accepting the action plan, which is specifically just future engineering studies, mm -hmm. and that's it. Because mm -hmm. I don't know any other stuff that you guys have been talking about. It's all new. To me, I mean, we hear things about it, but we don't get presentations. All right. And I, and I, was it unanimous? Um, it was seven to one in the final council vote. Right. Okay. Seven to one. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Commissioner Seal. And um, I'll support it, but I, <laughs> I will tell you that. One of the pleasures of driving in St. Petersburg is in the downtown that as a driver, the traffic works on one-way streets. And I am fearful about a change. Also, I understand from looking at pedestrian and bicyclists, but oftentimes having to only look one way rather than two ways and then you know have a middle turn lane, which you have on Gulf to Bay, which is not the safest thing in the whole wide world, um, concerns me. But I mean, I'm very respectful that you know this has gone through the process that it's gone through. I'm just fearful that you know you may have unintended results. Okay, Council Member Gabbard. So we did have conversation about that. Um, my office uh, in my other life is located um, on that section of 4th Street where it is the two-way. Um, so I brought up that very same concern. But one of the other concerns that we have downtown, and Councilmember Driscoll, it being her district, can speak specifically to it, is the speed of which people go down those one ways. Because once you hit those, if those lights synchronize, you can fly through downtown. And that is incredibly dangerous. And also, um, a lot of businesses kind of get passed by as people are flying through. I would also, so I feel like there will be um, some traffic calming that will come from this. I think it will be good for business. Um, I, was, I was very skeptical as well, but I think through what we have talked about and um, you know, Whit and I have talked about it, I've talked about it with our uh, transportation staff, I feel as though the benefits outweigh the concerns overall and just getting those cars to slow down and take their time as they go through downtown, I think is going to be a benefit. But certainly I think Council Member Driscoll can probably speak even more to that because she lives and serves in that area. And uh, yeah, I see her fingers up, so I'll yield to her. <laughs> Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. Uh, with the, the one-way streets do create higher speeds, which sure makes it easier to get in and out of downtown, but it does create that opportunity for speeds that are um, higher than what we want. We have more people downtown who are going around, um, getting around without a car as well. It's a very um, pedestrian friendly downtown and it's a very bike friendly um, city. We also have way more fatalities than is acceptable. And that number is going up because of our increased density. This is the time for us to um, make these adjustments to our traffic patterns to account for that higher density and the need to create a safer environment for everyone to get around, even if it means that someone has to slow down a little bit if they're in a car. 
I live on a one-way street, and so I see it all the time. I see people going the wrong way down a one-way street. I've seen crashes happen because of that, and no one is going the speed limit. Um, this is, a, and it's not just a, a study for like the last year or anything like that. This is a trend, and it's something that will help us um, with responsible growth management as a whole as our city grows. But I think what's interesting, and I don't mean to debate it, but um, Beach Drive actually had higher accident levels, and that's a two-way street with a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists. So I only point that out because I'm always scared when I'm going on to Beach Drive. I'm like looking every which way to make sure I'm not, um, you know, the crosswalks are there, and I'm trying to be cognizant of everybody around me. Right. And so I just worry about that. That's all. Yeah, we do too. And that's why we've talked about actually closing Beach Drive off to vehicular traffic altogether because the sheer number of, mm -hmm. um, of visitors, especially tourists and especially those who are frequenting our bars on Beach Drive, um, it makes for um, a, a risky mix. And so that's why the speeds are very low. That's why bicycles are allowed to have full use of the lane. That's why we have scooter corrals on that because it slows everything down. Two ways, slows everything down. Imagine if Beach Drive was one way. Mm. It would be a nightmare. So I am thrilled about this study and these results and the um, higher level of safety that it's going to bring to our downtown area. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Are we all set? And we have a motion and a second, and this is an all in favor. Say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. One. Okay, Thank motion carries. You. Let's uh, move on to approval of the annual Pinellas Planning Council budget and millage rate, that is 7E, and this will be presented by Rodney Chapman. We're not making it any easier on you today. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. Um, it's me again to talk uh, about the budget. It's a follow-up discussion to what we talked about last month. I really appreciate the, uh, the board's uh, comments uh, to me, it provided clear direction that we then relayed uh, back to um, our counterparts at the Office of Management and Budget. So um, I'll try to get straight to it, but um, what we were able to do with OMB was to uh, develop a scenario, it was actually our seventh scenario, uh, built around these uh, four assumptions. So uh, as you may recall, last month's meeting you talked about uh, keeping three of the six vacant positions, the positions we felt that were very critical to the completion of not only our work, but having a, a fully staffed agency. Uh, we also talked about uh, ensuring that we had revenues sufficient enough for us to maintain three months of operating expenses in emergency situations. Uh, we also wanted to ensure that we had an adequate fund balance in order for us to respond to uh, local government needs, as well as fulfill the matching requirements for some of the federal grants that we've talked about uh, here today, like um, re reconnecting communities that Christina just mentioned. Uh, so in looking at those assumptions, uh, we uh, again had the overarching goal of developing that balanced budget that corrects the structural imbalance that we talked about before, where our revenues are equaling, equaling our expenditures, and we're not using the fund balance every year to develop a balanced budget. So uh, what you have in your packet today is the FY23 budget, which does include a millage increase from the current rate of 0 0.0150 to 0 0.0235. That also includes, as we talked about at last month's meeting, an increase in the property tax revenues. Uh, last month when we talked, the projection from OMB was a bit lower, but I just got revised numbers last week, and so those have been factored into uh, the budget um, Accordingly, we also had OMB update their projection on how that new millage rate would uh, affect 
the average single family homeowner and you see that would equate to about $1.73 more in property taxes of what they currently pay. Uh, overall, the revenues total about $3.7 million. So that's, again, property taxes, uh, the revenues the PPC receives from the MPO to cover staff salaries and benefits, our local assistance, and then a small amount of interest. On the expense side, again, it's a little over $3.7 million. So uh, our goal was to ensure that our revenues equaled those expenditures. And in this scenario, we have done that. And there is about $33,000 uh, more on the revenue side under this current millage rate and budget scenario. Um, the reserves or that beginning fund balance for fiscal year 24 is a little over a million dollars. Again, uh, that is um, money that we would plan to uh, make available in various forms to our local government partners. Uh, just an anecdote that I'll share with the board is, uh, you know, we've traditionally done different pilot programs uh, in terms of providing that technical assistance to our local governments. And what we think is uh, very attractive to local governments is the ability of those funds to be made available pretty quickly. So, for example, we met with the city of Oldsmar last week about our urban design services pilot program because they expressed some interest in accessing those funds. And so the first question that the city manager, Felicia Donnelly, asked us was, how, available, how soon can we get the funds? Is this something like we got to wait you know, a year or, or five years, and we said, no, these funds are available now. So the timeliness of those funds are, are critically important to our partners, as well as, uh, as has been talked about quite a bit today, about the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the amount of new uh, grant funding programs that are available. All of those programs have a 20% local match. And so having that amount of beginning fund balance allows for us to cover that 20% out, uh, out of these funds. Again, we do maintain uh, those three full-time vacant positions that we have, two on our finance side, and then a planner position. Uh, we have been able to calculate that uh, three months of operating expenses for our agency is about $600,000, and we have set those funds aside in the contingency line out, and we confirmed with OMB that that's the best place for them. Again, they would only be used in emergencies, but would roll forward if we uh, don't expend them. Uh, the, I guess, silver lining in all this is that our intergovernmental service charges haven't really increased this uh, fiscal year for the first time um, since I've had this responsibility. So uh, the numbers have been revised, and it's only uh, about an $880 increase. So we were happy to see that. And lastly, just um, wanted to give you some historical context of uh, the millage rate that uh, the agency has had in place going back to 1996, although the PPC has existed in some form since 1965 and was reconstituted in its current form in 1988. But you can see on the, uh, the chart there in blue that back in fiscal year 96, the millage rate was 0 0.0214 mils. And, it fluctuated uh, a bit uh, up to fiscal year 07, then went down uh, beginning in 08, and then just kind of been at a, a lower level. And uh, what we are asking for or your um, consideration today is to, again, raise that millage rate up to 0 0.0235. Um, so uh, the next steps in the process after the board takes action today is uh, for our agency to go to the Board of County Commissioners and have a, a discussion about the budget on June 16th. Uh, there will be um, additional tax uh, revenue information released by the property appraiser on July 1st. That will then have, require us to amend our budget documents and we'll bring those amended documents back to you at your August meeting. And then the Board of County Commissioners uh, will uh, adopt the final millage rates and budget at their at two uh, meetings in September. So, any questions? Any questions for Rodney at this time? Yes, Council uh, Commissioner Edgar. Um, well, first of all, what is the uh, cost associated with the three positions that you're keeping but not or you're keeping but not filling, um, and how does that? If we get rid of those positions, how does that change our neat required millage to do what you want to do? I mean, I, it, I just see a you know a 56 percent increase in your millage rate, 
and a 12% increase in property values probably coming. Um, and seems, again, I see numbers, but I see, you know, some, it's pretty irresponsible in my mind to be increasing a millage rate by that kind of percentage. Just, like, never seen one like that. So, um, just curious what that would equate to and if by getting rid of those positions today and not carry them. Sure. The total compensation number for the planner position, which includes salaries and benefits, is uh, budgeted at 72000 The accounting services coordinator is budgeted at 77000 and the accounting and finance technician is budgeted at 61000 Just to add a little bit more information, the planner position <clears throat> is open because we promoted internally uh, Jared Austin to a principal planner. So he's now doing two jobs, his old planner job and the principal planner. The finance technician, uh, we had a retirement. Uh, we hired Margie Green to replace that retirement, but now we're moving her into that position. And uh, DOT has um, identified some areas of improvement in our invoicing, so this would provide the time that we need to adequately do all that. Uh, we also know that we need to go out for procurement of planning consultants, and we lost our procurement officer, so we have nobody with any procurement experience uh, in our agency. So it partly is to help shoulder some of those burdens uh, is what those positions are. But the big one is the planning position because we promoted within, and that created that vacancy. Anyone else? Any questions? Com uh, Mayor Bujowski. Last time we talked about budgets, um, there was a discussion, you know, about the whole employee raise thing. Where did wh where did you come down to conclude? So uh, all the assumptions that are baked into this budget are a 3.4% general increase for all unified personnel system employees. Uh, we do have a meeting on June... 14th, um, so next week with the appointing authorities to discuss consistency in what everybody would assume is, is, is the right uh, amount. Um, this board last month uh, expressed what I heard was that 3% was inappropriate uh, given the inflation situation right now, but I don't want to act unilaterally, so we've kept that assumption here of what this millage increase would do would would cover um, any potential increase that is agreed upon by the appointing authorities. And I've heard discussions anywhere from five to 6%, but I don't know officially what's planned. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone else at this time? Uh, hearing none, Tina, is there anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify what I heard. Sorry, I wanted to clarify what I heard you say. Did you say that this budget um, is, you have budgeted 3.4%? Correct. But then if the appointing agency board gets together and says 5 to 6%. We would revise that. We would revise that. And would the recommended 0 0.0235 mils cover it would. that additional? It, it would. As Rodney said, there's a little bit extra okay. over our expenses. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think it would be reasonable. I mean, I stand in the exact same place I stood last month with, I mean, this in this amount of overworking our staff um, because we don't have the monies to fill the void concerns me greatly. Um, and 3.4% to me just, I, I'm really hoping that the outcome of that meeting is that everyone stands united in supporting the staff people who keep our county running. Um, so, I mean, certainly I think that what was it? A dollar seventy? Dollar seventy-three. Yes. Yeah, a dollar seventy-three is minimal in the grand scheme of trying to make sure that we continue to run an efficient organization. So, I'm, I'm Mom, there. I could not agree with uh, Commissioner Br <coughs> Council Member Council Member Gabbard enough. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, that's insulting that you talk about a three point whatever it is, because the cost of living is more than twice that much. We can't expect our staff people to continue working as hard as they do. Um, and if we're not willing to go to bat a little bit for them, because at the end of the day, you have to be concerned about parity in the job market. 
I mean, probably every one of them don't get any ideas. <laughs> Could go and double their salary tomorrow if they wanted to leave. But they like working here and they like working with WIT. And we have a great team. And I, for one, would like to see you um, go at a minimum 5% because I'm pretty sure that's where we'll end up on the commission for our people. Thank you. Commissioner Long, anyone else at this time? Tina, is there any member of the public who would like to speak on the budget item? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you. At this time, any more questions? If not, um, is there a motion? I will make a motion to approve the recommendation until this 5%. You're making the 5% part of your motion? Is there a second? The mill increase. I yeah, but I, the, the millage has been recommended as well as. Microphone. Microphone. Yes, my motion is to go with the millage that has been recommended and to also include a 5% for our staff. Is there a second? While I'm supportive, I would rather wait. We haven't had any county budget discussions, and I always like to try to keep things the same as far as parity, and we haven't made that decision. So I can support the millage increase, but I'd rather wait until we um, go through our county budget before I would support. It, it might even be more increase. I don't know what it's going to be. So, if, I, But I do I support the that. staff, and I agree completely that we need to do something. I just don't know what it is yet. Commissioner Long, do you want to amend I your motion? Just, I was going to say I would accept that as a recovery in that. Thank you. <laughs> um, as long as we make sure that we come back and take action. So can we keep, are you a part of the appointment? I am. Meaning I am. Meaning that it's going to mm -hmm. take place, you've got to be able to have a, you know. Commissioner Long, is your mic on? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, I consider consistent. that a friendly motion, Commissioner thank Seal. Thank you. I do want to make sure everybody realizes, though, that WIT's part of the the um, appointing authority. The appointing authority meeting that's going to take place tomorrow, I think. Next week. Or next week, and that we want to make sure he's in a position to have a thoughtful conversation when he meets with them, because they will have an impact on on. Commissioner Seal's point about our own budget work within the county. Thank you. Okay, is everybody else okay now that you understand that we're gonna we're going to do this exactly as it is in here at this time? Okay. I mean, I was uh, no, I'm, I need clarification. Um, what exactly is the friendly amendment? The amendment to that just do the millage. Yes. Yes. That we wait to make a final decision until after we hear what the appointing authority and the county's And if I can clarify, as Rodney indicated, we will have to bring this back to you at your August meeting mm -hmm. because we'll have new, um, we'll ha not only will we have that worked out, but we'll also have um, additional information about the property valuation, okay. the finalization of that. So this, this basically transmits it. And then when all that finalizes the budget, you'll have uh, another chance to review in August. Okay, I mean, I'm fine with that. I was going to offer an amendment that said a minimum of 5%, and then that way we could lock in something today but still have flexibility. But um, we can, we can. I, I mean, we're going to have a discussion about this in the future yeah. at our next meeting. So yes. I'm, I'm happy either way. I, I think I've heard clearly from the direction. Yeah. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in providing me with support and background, mm -hmm. um, I've heard from some of you at least on that. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. Council um, member. So that was going to be my question, was do you need a formal motion of any sort to be able to have that direction at that meeting? Because that was the reason I seconded the motion, feeling like maybe you needed that kind of you know formal move to help you be able to sit at the table and say your board supports that. I mean, I think it, it, would, it would help, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm the little dog in this fight here. You know, I mean, the clerk of court and the county administrator 
have a lot more employees than I do and a lot more budget responsibility than I do. Um, but I appreciate being an equal with them at these meetings. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think the sentiment from the board members that I've heard from, I don't think we need a vote of the board on what that percentage needs to be, but a concern about employee recruitment, retention, uh, acknowledgement of their uh, hard work uh, is important, and I'll certainly convey that in the meeting. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, anyone else at this time? And Tina, we've already asked if anyone is in, a member would like to speak that's out in the audience. That is correct, Madam Chair. We just need a vote on the floor. Uh, would you prefer to do a roll call because of this, or we don't? Need a roll call. We don't it, you don't? You don't? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries, and uh, Commissioner Edgar's is one nay. Thank you, and uh, we will move on now to the director's report. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Um, good discussion today on a lot of topics. I'll be brief. Uh, I'll start with the spotlight update. Uh, on June 3rd, we had a meeting of the Gateway Partnership, and just a reminder that this board adopted the Gateway Area uh, Master Plan as a emphasis area. We completed a master plan. We got every local government uh, to sign the M Memorandum of Understanding um, to commit to implementing that, and uh, we had a good meeting where uh, Every one of these meetings, we have all of our local government partners report out what's happening in the gateway, what are they working on, so we learned some things there. But I really wanted to mention to you that uh, we uh, have some potential funding from the Florida Department of Transportation to develop a uh, transportation management organization for commute options, first mile, last mile, in the gateway area. And the partnership was supportive of us moving forward with that on the condition that we had the support of the employers and businesses in the Gateway area. Uh, some of you may remember or know that in the 1990s, Pinellas County had a transportation management organization or initiative for the Gateway area, and it didn't really gain a lot of traction, and ultimately it went away. Um, the DOT, um, their money, they don't want to spend it on staff. They want to spend it on projects. So what we would do is reach out to the businesses, uh, the employers in the Gateway area, and, and identify some potential uses of that funding for, for projects. We need to know what they need first. Um, so that, that was an ongoing discussion, but um, it was a good start. And I think that's really the only thing I wanted to convey about that. You have uh, all received an email from uh, us uh, with the Department of Transportation's response to the request at the last meeting to move the pedestrian underpass at US 19 and Republic Drive uh, further to the north. And uh, the DOT response um, essentially was that that would affect the ramps getting from the frontage roads to the next interchange or the next overpass to the north. And um, really the only option is either to get rid of the underpass uh, or um, there's really no way to move it. And this board did not seem to want to get rid of it. There was also a substantial cost uh, associated with that and a substantial delay of moving the project forward. And I think I heard from the board pretty clearly that those were two uh, thresholds they didn't really want to consider. So I appreciate the department's quick response to the inquiry from the public about that. Uh, Whit? Yes, sir. And I just really wanted to say thank you to the department and to you for looking into it. I Absolutely. mean, the businesses obviously are the ones that have struggled the last three years. Yep. And so going above and beyond, just looking into it, I think was a minimal thing that we could do. Um, and I appreciate that quick turnaround as well. Yeah, Pass yeah. that along if you will. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and again, I never shy away from people requesting us to look at things differently and uh, reconsidering things. Um, and so I'm glad that we at least did that. Um, I, I did want to let you know about the urban gondola study to downtown Clearwater and Clearwater Beach. I, I mentioned that briefly earlier. I received a presentation from T-BARDA staff and the consultant on it. Uh, they have briefed the Clearwater um, City Council, and they've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with the mayor, with the city manager, I believe. And there seems to be some, some support in the city of Clearwater for this. They're looking at alignment options. The cost is in the stations, more so than the, the, the ropeway is what it is. Um, and they haven't presented any cost yet. They're not quite to that point, but they're looking at station locations anywhere from just north of here, uh, at near our building, where the, where the parking garage is, um, up to the imagined Clearwater waterfront uh, for this location. 
And um, it seems Clearwater uh, City is not that interested in tying it into Imagine Clearwater, but they're open uh, to options. And they have identified a few parcels that they don't want this to have a station because they're in negotiations with, with uh, potentially selling those um, parcels. But I think all's moving forward uh, as best as we can, can see, and it seems like a pretty good project. Uh, it's going to be up to the city of Clearwater if they want to see it advanced. But that's another option for getting people not only from downtown to the beach, but getting tourists who are visiting the beach back into downtown and imagine Clearwater, which I think is something that city staff are particularly interested in. Quick yes. Quick question. Um, who is going to be the operator of that service? Uh, that's to be determined. Okay. Um, you know, if this could be a privately operated public-private partnership, uh, or it could be under public okay. Uh, operation. Okay, very good. Thank I think you. it would likely be some sort of public-private partnership. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the last item I have under spotlight is our target employment industrial land study update. Um, we had a uh, advisory committee meeting uh, recently that, that went really well. We've started to sift through the employer survey results that we've gotten, and we will be prepared to make a presentation to this board soon on this topic. Uh, actually, tomorrow, uh, Jared Austin of our staff is presenting the findings so far to the Upper Tampa Bay Chamber, which is particularly interested in this, and we got a request on that. And um, we've had a lot of discussions about things like the Warehouse Arts District, how that ties into this, uh, and also other areas around the county. And uh, we had a meeting earlier this week with uh, Cynthia Johnson and Kevin Knutson of Pinellas County, who uh, are very interested in the study, and they've actually asked uh, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council to undertake some complementary work to our industrial land study. So we're making sure that that work is all aligned, and um, I'm comfortable with that moving forward. So I just wanted to let you know that we're still in the sausage-making part of this study, but um, probably within about the next month or two, we will have a, a, a preliminary set of uh, findings for you on it. Any questions on any of this? Okay, um, and then I'll just go right on into my next uh, item under director's report. Uh, we are beginning a geofencing safety pilot project. Uh, our team has worked with FDOT to select uh, Park Boulevard, which is one of our high injury network roadways, uh, to deploy this uh, safety pilot project, project. And what geofencing really means is that we're establishing a virtual buffer around the Park Boulevard corridor that we will use to communicate with drivers, uh, safety messages, and uh, um, speed management uh, information, and essentially alerting them uh, that um, you know speeding uh, carries a certain level fine and reinforcing that message through social media. And then we will follow that up with a monitoring program to see how that affects speeds in the corridor. Uh, I've got some really good news from the department. They are looking to host a workshop this fall, uh, sometime between August and October, uh, with elected officials and staff, and we might split it into two segments um, to look at how we can move the safety needle in District 7. And they've proposed having these workshops in each one of the counties in District 7 because the needs are different depending on where you are. And um, they have brought in our consultant for this geofencing safety study who did our Vision Zero work to lead those workshops. So we feel very good about the continuity of that. And um, I would welcome your thoughts and ideas on how we do that workshop, but look for a draft agenda from, from us sometime in the next month or two on that. And that'll, again, take place sometime between August and uh, October. And I really want to encourage our local government partners to be present at this workshop. Uh, we've, um, we're still working on some of the Safe Streets resolution adoptions. I am going to the city of Pinellas Park uh, in maybe a month, so I look forward to doing that. Uh, and then uh, Tarpon Springs has said that they are putting this at the top of their priority to adopt. And I'm still waiting to hear from um, the city of Clearwater and a couple of other locations. But for the most part, we're starting to check all the boxes. And we have a uh, safety... Safe Streets for All um, notice of funding opportunity that's out. Uh, project applications are due in September 15th, and we have begun developing an idea for that. Uh, now, here's some limits on this. First of all, you can only have one application per jurisdiction. So we could submit 25 applications, 26 if you include us. Uh, that's probably not a good strategy. 
uh, but I think some of our cities may very well submit implementation funding um, applications. We are proposing a planning grant application that would be uh, another step beyond our Vision Zero plan. And we're proposing to do three to four small area planning studies to define specific safety projects in concert with our local government partners. So Oldsmar has reached out to us uh, and we're having a meeting with them on that next week. Uh, Tarpon Springs has reached out to us. And is it Largo? Dunedin as well, yeah, thank you. So those are at least three and we're open to doing more um, on that. And that would be one application from us in partnership with those cities. And uh, one thing Rodney mentioned in the budget is all these safe streets applications come with an 80-20 match. So that 20% match is something that we're, we've built into our budget with this millage increase. So if it happens, uh, we would have the flexibility to be able to meet that match either with or in lieu of our partners at the local government level. So just that gives us the flexibility that we need. That's all I have. Don't no. forget we don't have a meeting in July, and so I hope you have a nice fourth and a nice rest of July, the rest of this month in June, and we'll see you in August. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.